Section 67 of A Fair Mystery. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 67 A Clue at Last. The morning that followed was beautiful the lady doris felt more cheerful than she had done for many long days early would manage it all for her she should find a way out of all her difficulties lord vivian could not follow her to linley even if he did she should foil him again and again when once she was early's wife she could defy him it was not likely that she would fear him then her heart and spirits rose alike she smiled at her own fair image in the glass early as it was a fragrant bouquet of white hyacinths lay on the toilet table sent by some adoring lover who evidently hoped that the flowers would say for him what he could not say for himself she smiled over them inhaling the rich odor with delight thinking of herself the while what a poet early is what a rapture he went into last night about flowers and summer she felt better the sun was shining in at her windows the sweet breath of hyacinths reached her it seemed impossible that sorrow or death should come into such a bright world she smiled to herself when she heard that early was with her father he has most certainly lost no time she said to herself yet nearly an hour passed before the earl left the library then owing to a stranger's being present he could not speak to her of what had passed he merely touched her hand doris he said i have been having a long talk with early and i must have one with you before dinner i will remember papa she said then as the day was so fine early prayed her to ride out with him an hour in the park would be so pleasant he said and lady linley thought the same doris was quite willing to go when they were under the shade of the trees early went more slowly my darling he said i knew that you would be anxious to hear what has passed i think he continued bringing his handsome face on a level with hers i think that i shall make an excellent diplomatist in time i never doubted replied doris i was quite pleased with myself early went on to say I made quite an impression on the earl. Her lips grew pale, and parted with a long, quivering sigh. She looked at him anxiously. In one word, early, is it to be as I wished, or not? Yes, he replied, in every particular. Then she resigned herself to listen. I never mentioned you at all in the matter, he continued. I told him that I had observed your health and strength failing, and that I felt quite convinced, unless you rested at once, you would suffer seriously from the effects of the over-fatigue. He agreed with me and said that Lady Linley had remarked the same thing, and was equally anxious over you, and said that the wisest thing to do was to leave town at once and go to Linley. But would he and lady linley be willing to give up the remainder of the season she asked they care more for you than for the season he replied my opinion is that lady linley secretly enjoys the idea of leaving town and about you know what i mean early about our wedding darling it is to be in the sweet summer time that is if you are willing i urged it and the countess joined me 
Lord Lindley, heaven bless him, did not raise the least objection. He said he would speak to you and was perfectly kind and good about it. It will be for you to tell him, dear, your wish to have it all managed very quietly and to speak of going abroad. Now, is not that glorious news for a bright sunshiny day? How green the trees are, and how blue the sky! Was the world ever so fair? Love ever one half so fair? Suddenly he saw her start, and looking at her saw an angry flush on her face, a bright light in her eyes. She was looking intently at someone who returned the glass with interest. Following the direction of her eyes, Early saw Lord Vivianne watching her most intently. There was a smile that was yet half a sneer on his lips. He was talking to a gentleman whom Early instantly recognized as Colonel Clifford. There is your vete noir, Doris, Lord Vivianne, he said. I see him, he replied quietly. He did not know the hot impulse that was on her. He did not understand why she clinched the little jewel whip so tightly in her hand. She would have given the whole wide world if she dare have ridden up to him, and have given him one stroke across the face with her whip, one stroke that would have left a burning red brand across the handsome, insolent face. She would have gloried in it. She could fancy how he would start and cry out, The coward! How he would do his best to hide the shameful mark given to him by a woman's hand. In all her life, Lady Doris Studley never had such a difficulty in controlling an impulse as she had in controlling that. Then she was recalled to herself by a bow from Lord Vivian and a look on unqualified wonder on her lover's face. Doris, he said, my dear child, what are you going to do to Lord Vivian? You look inclined to ride over him. So am I, she replied with a smile. But the beauty of the morning had gone for her. There was no more warmth in the sunshine, no more fragrance in the flowers and trees no music in the bird's song the sight of that handsome face with its evil meaning had destroyed it all had made her heart sink oh to be away from him where she should never see him or hear of him again i am tired early she said tired so soon he replied but one look at her told him the words were quite true we will ride back again, Doris. Tell me, why do you dislike Lord Vivian so much? I am not sure that I dislike him, she replied. You do, sweet. Your face quite changed when you saw him. Did it? I do not like him because he teases me so with compliments. I dislike many people. He's no great exception. Early laughed. It is very unfortunate to admire you, Doris, if admiration brings dislike. They rode home again, while Colonel Clifford turned with a smile to his companion. That looks like a settled case, he said. What do you mean by a settled case? was the irritable reply. I defied any man to understand his own language in these degenerate days. A settled case means that, to all appearances, the queen of the season, the fetid, flattered Lady Doris Studley, is in love with our young poet, the latest London celebrity. A young poet? Who is he? For suddenly there flashed into his mind the words Doris Brace had so poetically used to him. My lover is a gentleman and a poet. At the time he had thought it idle bombast, intended only to heighten her value in his eyes. Yet it might have been true. He looked up with unusual interest. Who is he, Clifford? he repeated. 
I can hardly tell you, except that he is Earle Moray, a great protege and favourite of the Duke of Downsbury, of Lord Linleigh, and of the public in general, for he is a charming writer. He is also a member of Anderley. He took his seat last week. Earle Moray? I am sure I know the name. Most English readers do, said Colonel Clifford. A sudden flash of light seemed to illuminate his mind. Early, early, why, that is the name Doris used to murmur in her sleep. She used to dream that early was coming. I remember it well. Great heaven, it is she. What is the matter? asked Colonel Clifford. You look as though you had seen a ghost. So I have, the ghost of my... Oh, what nonsense I'm talking. So what is the young poet? He's a very handsome man. Lady Stoyley is something like the Earl. Is it known who her mother was? No. People say that the Earl contracted a low marriage before he went abroad, one that he was ashamed to own. Therein consists the romance. What romance? asked Lord Vivian hurriedly. About Lady Doris, the Earl, when he was simply Captain Stodley, married beneath him, went abroad, leaving his daughter to be brought up by some humble friends of his wife. The romance consists, I suppose, in the sudden change in the young lady's fortune, from comparative obscurity to splendor. It might have been an unfortunate thing for the earl but that the girl turned out to be beautiful graceful intelligent and well-bred i have it by heavens cried lord vivian in a loud voice you have what a uh, a fly that has been buzzing round me and teasing me half the morning he replied confusedly ah said the colonel my opinion of you, Lord Vivian, is not a very complimentary one. I fancy, unless you take better care of your wits, they will leave you. I never saw any one grow so peculiar in all my life. I saw no flies about. Lord Vivian made no reply, but went away laughing. It seemed to him that now he held the clue in his hand. If I am right, he said to himself with a bitter sneer. I will humiliate her. I will lower that magnificent pride of hers. I will change places, and she shall be the wooer. But I must make quite sure first. I will go down to Brackenside this very day. He kept his word, much to honest Mark's surprise. When he entered the house that evening, he found a fashionably dressed stranger bent upon being very agreeable to his wife and daughter you will be surprised to see me said his willy lordship but i was passing through brackenside and could not help calling i am quite a stranger allow me to introduce myself as lord vivian you he continued holding out his hand to mark are mr brace mark replied in a suitable manner then sat down with a look of resignation that highly amused Mattie. If it could rain lords, he could not help it. Such wonderful events had happened that Mark felt he should never be surprised again. Then he looked in his lordship's face as though he could fain ask what he wanted there. I had the pleasure once, it is some time since, of meeting your daughter, Miss Doris Brace, if she is at home, I should like to see her. At the first sound of that name, Mark was on the alert. This was just what they had cautioned him about. The Earl had bidden him beware of impertinence and curiosity. Mark had passed his word not to speak of Doris's history, and he meant to keep it. Wild horses, as he expressed it, could not have torn it from him. Miss Doris Brace is not at home, he replied grimly. Indeed, said the stranger, I am sorry for that. I had relied upon seeing her, 
perhaps I may be more fortunate to morrow. I do not think you will, was the reply. She will not be at home. Perhaps then the day after? was the insinuating comment. No, nor the day after, replied Mark. She will not be at home. She is not in Brankenside. Now, my lord had laid all his plans most prudently. He did not intend to compromise himself at all. If the whole affair turned out to be a huge mistake, as it might do, he would not say anything that could prejudice his cause in the least. No harm could possibly arise if he said that he had met Miss Doris Brace. He had seen her at the castle, and if hardly pushed, he could quote that meeting but the farmer was a very fortress. He returned none but the most simple, vague, and honest answers, saying that she was not at home. She would not be at home, but looking most amiable deaf when any allusion was made to change of fortune. End of chapter 67 Recording by Gaby Cowan Section 68 of A Fair Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gaby Cowan. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 68. Lord Vivian proposes a little discussion. If I may take the liberty, said Lord Vivian, turning with his most amiable smile to Mrs. Brace, I should so much like to ask for a cup of tea. I was anxious to see your daughter, so did not wait to take any refreshments at the hotel. It is a great disappointment to me. Yes, said Mark quietly. It is wonderful how many disappointments we have to bear. The tea was prepared, and Mrs. Bray's heart was won by praise of the excellent tea. The thick cream, the fresh golden butter, and ripe fruit, woman-like, her heart secretly inclined to the handsome stranger whom Mark kept so sternly at bay. But where could he have possibly seen Doris? Mark saw symptoms of relenting in his wife's eyes under pretext of speaking to her about the milking and cheese he drew her into the larder now look here patty he said my word is past and i do not mean to break it i told the earl that no matter who came who asked or what was wanted doris's name and history should never be told and it never shall i am sure mark said his obedient wife this is a gentleman there can be no mistake about him gentleman oh there now my dear do not look so frightened i never swore in my life not even in the hottest of weather i am not going to begin now he may be a gentleman he is i do not deny that but it has nothing to do with the matter why does he come here to talk about Doris? What has it to do with him? It means mischief. He shall go away from here as wise as he came, no wiser. You are right, Mark, said his wife. That is a sensible woman, yet, added Mark, with a shrewd irony. The sight of his handsome face and the smoothness of his tongue may cause you to betray a secret you have promised to keep so you had better keep out of the room i will said mrs brace i have no more wish to talk than you have mark still he looks so wistful i will stay away that is the best woman in england said mark to himself as mrs brace closed the door after her then he returned to his guest he apologized for his wife's absence but lord vivian knew just as well as though mark had told him that she was gone lest she should be tempted to talk to him 
mattie wisely imitated her mother's example leaving her father alone with his guest what a grand old farm this is of yours said his lordship i never saw grounds in such fine condition mark had made up his mind to be urbane and polite but it was with some little difficulty he refrained from showing his contempt what does this lord know of farming above all why did he want to flatter mark brace i am rather pleased said the visitor drawing his chair nearer to the farmer that i have a chance of talking quietly to you without the ladies being present i wanted that opportunity you have it said mark briefly yes i have it and will try to avail myself of it i met as i told you miss doris bray some time since and i was deeply impressed by her most deeply were you yes and i resolved if possible to see her again mark sat silent i quite believed at the time that she was your daughter but i have heard a strange romance since terrible strange may i ask mr brace if it be true no my lord you may not ask me at least i do not mean that you may ask what you will but you must excuse me if i do not reply the fact is this if you ask as to the state of my farm my balance at the bank my hopes of a crop i will tell you but when it comes to the ladies of my family you must really excuse me if i distinctly and plainly refuse to answer one question concerning them i am sorry to seem rude my lord but like every one else who saw him lord vivianne admired mark brace he held out his white slim hand to touch the farmer's sunburnt one there is no offence mr brace he said you are an honest man and i shall think better of all other men for having seen you if you decline any conversation on the matter it is of course useless for me to offer any explanations quite useless my lord a waste of time then thanking you for your hospitality i may as well go said his lordship with a smile to which remark the farmer not knowing what politeness required him to answer made no answer at all although he was baffled lord vivianne could not feel angry it would be a straightforward world he said to himself laughingly if all the men in it were like mark race still he felt that he had in some measure won a victory he had found out that in connection with tories there was something to conceal he went to quayton and took up his abode for the night in the castle hotel there he fancied he should be sure to hear something or other nor was he mistaken in the billiard room the conversation turned upon early murray they were very proud of him they said that lindenholm had given to england one of her finest poets they boasted to each other of having known him of having spoken to him they talked of his election for anderley there had been no bribery all had been open as the day yes he had been returned almost without opposition they spoke of lord linley's interest in him and then one or two of the wisest among them told how he was to marry lord linley's daughter the beautiful girl who for some reason or other had been brought up at brackenside it was impossible to keep such a secret quiet some few in quainton knew and others guessed it lord vivianne listened without a comment the veins in his forehead swelled his face flushed a hot crimson flush his hands trembled it was a victory he had hardly expected to win then he muttered to himself something that sounded like a fierce oath she shall pay for it he said to himself madly as i love her i will not spare her when i have humbled her pride 
I will worship her and marry her. Not until then. So it was she, all the time. She looked into my eyes without recognition. She dared me, braved me, laughed at me. She shall suffer. She is the most magnificent and dauntless creature I ever beheld. She is grand enough for a Charlotte Corday, a Joan of Arc. By heaven, how many girls would have come to me crying, praying that I would keep their secret. She laughs at me, defies me. I will repay her. His whole soul was torn between passionate love and passionate anger. At one time he felt inclined to weep at her feet, to pray and beseech her to love him, to be his wife. At another time, to feel that he must upbraid her with her perfidy, her falsity, her deceit. Which spirit would master him when he stood in her presence? He hardly knew. It would depend upon herself. If she were defiant, so should he be. If she were gentle, he would be the same. Of one thing he was quite determined. Do say what she might. She should be his wife. It would be a most dishonorable thing to threaten, to hold her secret over her. But if she compelled him, he would do it. No thought of pity came into his mind, but he wondered much. That news, the news of her father's succession to the earldom and his return home, must have reached her while she was in Florence with him. No one even knew where he was. How, then, could she learn it? It struck him that was the reason she had left him. He had not thought of that before. It was because this news came to her, and she would not be found with him. But who could have told her? That was the puzzle. Someone must have gone straight from England to Florence. The more he thought of it, the more he was puzzled. He felt quite certain that on the morning he left her to secure her opera box and to purchase flowers for her, she knew nothing of it. He had left her by the riverside. When he returned, she was gone. During that interval, short as it was, someone must have found her, have told her, and brought her to England. Who could that someone be? Not early. Surely not early, her lover. Surely not he. He would have been more likely to kill her than to bring her home if he had found her with me he said to himself. He was keen enough, but it never occurred to him that she had the skill to deceive early as well. He returned by the early train to London. He should be in time then, he said, to give her a morning call. He smiled to himself as he thought of her confusion. He reached Hyde House when the Earl and Countess had just driven to a fashionable dejeuner and Lady Doris was left alone. She desired it should be so. She wanted time to arrange her thoughts, to recover herself, and they, believing in her plea of fatigue, had been quite willing to leave her. She had made up her mind, no matter what it cost her, not to see Lord Vivianne again. It would be easy to manage it. She would decline all invitations on the plea of ill health and she would refuse to receive visitors at home. Strict orders had been given to that effect. The servants understood that their young lady was tired, and would see no one, except, as a matter of course, Mr. Murray. She believed herself quite safe. That morning early had promised to spend with her, and they would arrange about their wedding and the honeymoon that was never to end. She had dressed herself so prettily for early, she went to the conservatory intending there to spend the morning with him. She walked among the flowers, singing in a soft, low voice to herself. It would all soon be over. She should so soon be away from London, where her terrible secret seemed to have taken bodily shape. She should so soon be safe in her own home in Linley, 
above all she should soon be Earle's wife Earle's wife how he loves me thought the girl how true and good and noble he is my Earle. then a shadow fell over the brightness of the flowers she raised her eyes believing it was he and they fell on the smiling face of lord vivian for one instant she looked at him spellbound fascinated as one sees a fluttering bird charmed by a snake her heart gave one great bound he knows me she thought and he's come to tell me so how he gained admittance matters not how he bribed a servant who afterward lost his place for taking the bribe matters not he was there and in the contemptuous insolence of his smile in the expression of his face she read that no evasion would be of service to her still she did not lose her self-possession how did you obtain admittance my lord she asked imperiously oh dora dora i have found you did you really think you would deceive me for long i have found you and now if you please we will discuss matters in a proper business-like form End of chapter sixty eight recording by gabby cowan section sixty nine of a fair mystery this is a librebox recording all librebox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librebox dot org recording by gabby cowan a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter sixty nine the price of a secret he went one step nearer to her and looked at her with an evil smile his heart was full of passion half intense love and half furious anger you thought to deceive me he said and the breath came like hot flame from his lips you thought to blind me and dupe me but i know you now i have known you all along though i could not believe the evidence of my own senses he never forgot the regal grace with which she drew her slight frame to its utmost height the anger the haughty pride that flashed from her eyes i do not understand you she replied and i repeat my question when i gave orders that i should be denied to all visitors how dare you enter here it is late lady doris he said too late for that kind of thing now i repeat that i know you to the rest of the world you may be lady doris stoutly to me you are simply the girl who lived with me and ran away from me she looked at him if a glance from those proud eyes could have slain him he could have lain that instant dead at her feet he continued you may deny it you may continue to carry on the same concealment the same deceit but it will be all in vain i know you and i know you for what you are you can say anything you please if you think it advisable to waste words i repeat that it will be in vain she grew white even to the lips as she listened to the insolent words i felt sure convinced of your identity from the very moment i saw you at the opera he continued i watched you then i have watched you ever since her lips opened but all sound died away from them he heard nothing i have admired your talent for acting he continued it is a grand one it is ten thousand pities that you are not upon the stage you would be its brightest ornament i was not wholly but half deceived by your superb nonchalance then i determined to find out the truth for myself i have done so he waited to see if she would utter one word of denial one word of explanation she stood before him pale beautiful silent as a marble statue i have tracked you he said triumphantly 
I can tell you the whole story of your life, how you lived as a child at Brankenside, how you carry on a pretty little love affair with your poet and gentleman, until I saw you, how you went to Florence with me, in total ignorance of your true origin, how on the morning I left you by the riverside, someone came from England, told you the true story of your birth, and brought you back here. I have been to Brankenside. I am not speaking without proof. If she could have spoken, she would have told him that no one at Brankenside would ever betray her. She would have liked to cast his words back in his teeth, but the strength to speak was no longer hers. You thought then of being very clever. If you had never heard the true story of your birth, you would have been content to abide with me all the days of your life. You would have thought your lot a brilliant one, but you were too clever, Dora. You thought to escape and to live as though you had never heard of me. It could not be done. Did you speak? He might as well ask the question, for a sound that resembled no ordinary, no human sound came from her lips. He went on. Why were you not frank and honest with me, Dora? Why did you not await my return and tell me? Why did you not trust me? Do you know what I should have done if you had so trusted me? I should have said that my proposition to you had been made under a great mistake, not knowing your true name, and I should have released you then and then from all ties that bound you to me. She saw her mistake then, saw what short-sighted, miserable policy hers had been, but it was all too late. Surely, he continued, you had lived with me long enough to know that I had some semblance of a gentleman some faint notions of honour there is no need to sneer my lady men do not reckon honour when they deal with what you were then i know it she cried with sudden bitterness in a voice that had no resemblance to her own why did you not trust me i cannot i shall never forgive you for that way in which you deserted me had you left me one line only one line telling me your true parents had claimed you. Doris, it would have saved all this. I had no time, because you did not wish to make it. Even suppose that, to avoid detection, you had hurried from Florence, you might surely have sent me a line from England. Even if you could not trust me with your name and address, you might have done that. I see it now. I might, nay. I should have done it. Will that admission satisfy you? There is nothing in it to satisfy me, he said angrily. You had no right to desert me as you did, to treat me as you did, none in the world. Do you know what you cost me? Do you know that I went mad over losing you? That I searched you for day after day, month after month, hating my life itself because you no longer form part of it. Do you know that the loss of you changed me from a good-tempered man into a fiend? Can you realize that, Lady Doris Studley? No, she replied, I cannot. It is true, fair, bright, frivolous women like you cannot realize a man's love. They cannot even estimate it. And strange, oh, strange to say women like you win a strong, passionate love for which the pure and noble of your sex seek in vain. Alas, that she had given him the right to speak thus to her, that she had placed herself in the power of such a man, oh, fatal, foolish, and wicked sin, yet true to herself, true to her own light, frivolous nature, it was not the bitter sin she repented so much as its discovery. He drew nearer to her and placed one hand on her arm. Do you know, Doris, he said, that when you left me I had begun even then to love you with such a passionate love that every pulse of my heart was wrapped up in it. She shook his hand from her as though there were 
contamination in his touch. I did not know it. I do not believe it. You never loved me. You have loved nothing on earth one half so dearly as you have loved yourself. His face grew dark with anger. Remembering how entirely you were in my power, he said, I ask you, is it wise to anger me? You never loved me, she repeated. Early loved me, and would have died any day to save my fair name. You never loved me. You loved yourself. I repeat it. I loved you with a passion so terrible, so fierce, so violent. It frightened me. I loved you so, that I would have lost wealth, fortune, position. Ah, life itself, for you. Her white lips smiled scornfully. That calm, proud scorn drove him beside himself. You have been some time in discovering it, she said. That is your mistake, he replied. Do you know, Doris, I swear what I say is true. Do you know why I was so gay, so happy, so light of heart on the day you left me? It was because my love had beaten down my pride. And on that very evening, I had resolved upon asking you to be my wife. I do not believe it, she cried. It is true. I swear it on the faith and honor of a gentleman. I swear it on the word of a man. I should need a stronger oath than that, she said. I swear it then by your own falseness and by your own deceit. Can any oath be stronger than that? On that very evening, I had resolved upon asking you to be my wife. I was determined to make our union legal. I loved you so that I could not live without you. She made no reply for one minute, but looked steadily at him. Then she said, I do thank heaven that I have been spared the degradation of becoming your wife. Yet you were content to be my companion, he said. Her face flushed hotly at the words. I have lost you. How long, Tora? How many months? Do you think my love has grown less in that time? Do you think it has faded or grown cold? If you imagine so, you do not do justice to your own marvelous beauty. You do not do justice to your own fascination. A thousand times no. It is a burning torrent. Now that carries all before it, it is a tempest that will know no abatement. Dora, you had lost your usual shrewdness when you thought that absence could cure such love as mine. My name is Lady Studley, not Dora, she said proudly. Once for all, Lord Vivian, your love does not in the least interest me. You will have to take an interest in it, he replied. I swear, for the future I shall know no other love. I will never know yours, she replied. He laughed contemptuously. It is no use, Dora, he said. You must really excuse me. I cannot help enjoying my triumph. I could not laugh if I could help it. But, my dear Dora, I cannot help it. Did you ever see a fly in a spider's web? Did you ever watch it struggle and fight and strive to escape while the spider, one could fancy, was shaking his filmy sides with laughter? Have you ever seen that terrible phenomenon in natural history? You, my poor Dora, are the helpless little fly. I am the spider. It is not an elegant comparison, but it is perfectly true. You are in my power completely thoroughly and nothing can take you from me she looked at him quite calmly her courage was rising now that the first deadly shock had passed away perhaps she said you will tell me what you want spare any further conversation with you it does not interest me tell me briefly as you can what do you want what do i want he repeated yes just that neither more nor less what do you want 
I own you have me in your power. I own that you hold a secret of mine. What is to be its price? I cannot buy your silence with money. You are a gentleman, a man of honor. Having my fair name in your power, what shall you charge me for keeping it? I am anxious to know the price men exact for such secrets as those. You wooed me and won me, after your own honorable fashion. What are you going to exact now as the price of your love and my mad folly? I was vain, foolish, untruthful, but after all, I was an innocent girl. When you knew me first, what shall be the price of my innocence? O oh, noble descendant of noble men, O oh, noble heritor of a noble race, speak, let me hear. Her taunts stung him almost to fury. His face grew livid with rage. Yet the more insolent she, the more deeply he loved her. The more scornful she, the deeper and wilder grew his worship of her. I will tell you the price, he said. I will make you my wife. Consent to marry me, and I will swear to you, by heaven itself, that I will keep your secret faithfully, loyally, until I die. I cannot marry you, she replied. I do not love you. I cannot help it. If you are angry, I do not even like you. I should be most wretched and miserable with you, for I loathe you. I will never be your wife. All those, he replied slowly, are objections that you must try to overcome. What if I tell you I love someone else, she said. I should pity him, really pity him, from the depths of my heart, but all the same, I should say, you must be my wife. She longed to tell him that she loved and meant to marry early, but she was afraid even to mention his name. I shall conquer all your objections in time, he said. It is nothing to me that you say you dislike me. It is even less that you say you like another. But he never even thought that she really liked early. Had she not run away from him? End of chapter 69 Recording by Gabby Cowan Section 70 of A Fair Mystery This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org Recorded by Gabby Cowan A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay Chapter 70 The Coward's Threat That is the first part of your declaration, said Lady Doris, with the calm of infinite contempt. If I will promise to be your wife, you will promise to marry me. What if I refuse? You are placing a very painful alternative before me, he replied. Never mind the pain, my lord. We will waive that. I wish to know the alternative. If you will marry me, I will keep your secret, Lady Doris Studley, faithfully until death. Then I clearly, distinctly, and firmly refuse to marry you. What then? In that case, I shall be compelled to take the most disagreeable measures. I shall be compelled to hold your secret as a threat over you. If you refuse to be my wife, I'll tell you, quite honestly, that I will make you the laughing stock of all London. You, fair, beautiful, imperial, you shall be an object of scorn. Men shall laugh at you. Women turn aside as you pass by. Even the most careless and reckless shall refuse to receive you, shall consider you out of the pale. I will tell the whole world, if you compel me to do it, what you were to me in Florence. I will tell the handsome Earl, your father, whose roof in that case will no longer shelter you. I will tell your proud, high-bred stepmother, the haughty Duchess who presented you at court, nay, 
even the queen herself she who values a woman's good name far above all worldly rank you would do all that she said yes just as soon as i would look at you and you call that honour no it is on the contrary most dishonourable do not imagine that i seek to deceive myself it would be about the most dishonourable thing any person could do in fact nothing could be more base i grant that but if you drive a man mad with love what can he do you compel me to take the step or i would not take it she could not grow paler her face was already ghastly white but from her eyes there shot one glass that might from its anger and its fire have struck him blind you would not spare me she said because it was you yourself who led me to ruin i love you so madly he said that i cannot spare you at all have you thought she asked what if you do this deed the world will say of you and to you have you weighed this well i am indifferent he said i care for nothing on earth but winning you do you realize that in destroying me you destroy yourself that you will make yourself more hated and despised than any man ever was before do you not see that i repeat that nothing interests me save winning you dora i am quite willing to be destroyed with you what would the world say to a man who deliberately destroys and ruins a girl as you did me my dearest dora the world hears such stories every day and i am afraid rather admires the heroes of them what does it say then of cowardly men who having won such a victory boast of it i own that the world looks askance on such a man and very properly too it is a base cowardly thing to do what other curse is left me you drive me to it i have no wish to play such a contemptible part i have no wish to boast of a victory i shall hate myself for doing it but what else is there for it listen once and for all dora i cannot help calling you by the old familiar name i will have you for my wife i will marry you nothing i swear except death shall take you from me i will make you happy i will see that every desire of your heart is fulfilled but i swear you shall be my wife there is no escape no alternative either that or disgrace degradation and ruin do not think i shall hesitate for any fear of ruin to myself i would ruin myself to-morrow to win you you might as well try to stem the force of a tide as to alter my determination she saw that she was conquered mortifying humiliating as it was she was conquered there was no help for her she stood quite still for a moment then she said slowly will you give me time his face flushed hotly his triumph was coming a smile played round his lips and brightened his eyes time yes you can have as much time as you like you see the solution plainly do you not marry me and keep your fair name your high position defy me and lose it all you see it plainly yes there is no mistake about it you have made it most perfectly plain she said in a low passionless voice i quite understand you give me time to think it over i cannot decide it hurriedly what time do you require he asked i shall not be willing to wait very long it is june now she continued you cannot complain if i say give me until the end of august it shall be so dora will you give me your hand upon it no she replied i will not give you my hand come at the end of august and i will give you my answer 
I shall not be deprived of the happiness of seeing you until then, Dora. I cannot say. I will not be followed. I will not be watched. I claim my perfect freedom until then. You shall have it. Do not think worse of me than I deserve, Dora. If I had found you married, I would not have spoken. I would never even have hinted at the discovery. But you are not married, darling, nor while I live shall any man call your wife except myself. How bitterly at that moment she regretted not having been married. If she had known, if she had only known, he should have found her the wife of Early. I have no wish to injure you or to do anything except make life pleasant for you. But my love for you has mastered me. It has conquered me. You must be mine. Such passions shone in his eyes, gleamed in his face, that she shrunk back half frightened. He laughed as he said, It is one thing, you see, Dora, to light a fire, another to extinguish it. Now, will you leave me, Lord Vivian? You have placed the pleasing alternative very plainly before me. We have agreed upon a time until you come for my answer. That will be at the end of August. Until then, your own good sense will show you the proper course to pursue. You need neither seek nor avoid me. He bowed. I hope, Lady Studley, you will have overcome your great objection to my presence before you see me again. I will now go. Let me give you one word of warning. A desperate man is not to be trifled with. If you attempt to escape me, if you place yourself in any way legally out of my reach, you shall answer to me, not only with your fair name, but with your life. You hear? I hear, she replied calmly. But I do not come of a race that heeds threats. Good morning, my lord. Dora, he said, for the sake of old times, of the old love, will you not give me one kiss? I could rather see you dead, was the reply given with an angry bitterness she could not control. He laughed aloud. I shall soon see that pretty spirit's humble, he said. Good morning, my lady and the next minute he was gone. She stood for some little time where he had left her, such fiery passion and anger surging in her heart as almost drove her mad. Her face flushed crimson with it, her eyes flamed. She twisted her white hands until the gemmed rings made great dents in them. She hated him with such an intensity of hatred that she would have laughed over his death. Her graceful figure shook with its heavy strain of anger. Her lips parted with a low, smothered cry. I pray heaven to curse him, she cried, with a terrible life and terrible death, to send him a thousandfold the torture he has given me. I wish I could kill him. In the might of her wrath, she trembled as a leaf upon a tree. She raised her right hand to heaven. I swear I will never marry him, she said. Let him threaten, punish, disgrace, degrade me as he will. I swear that I will never marry him. I will lose love, happiness, wealth, position, nay, even life first. But I swear also that I will torture him and pay him for all he has made me suffer. She walked to and fro, never even seeing the brilliant blossoms and the glossy leaves, trampling the fragrant flowers she gathered underfoot, moaning with a low, piteous wail. It was too cruel, too hard. She had seen, yes, she knew that, sinned greatly, but surely the punishment was too hard. Others sinned and prospered. Why was she so heavily stricken? She was young when she sinned, careless, ignorant, heedless. Now she was to lose all for it. She had beauty that made all men her slaves. 
she had wealth such as she had never dreamed of she had one of the highest positions in the land she had above all the love of early the love and filthy of early now in punishment for this one sin she must lose all could heaven spare her was it of any use in this her hour of dire need praying why in all her life her brief brilliant life she had never prayed was it of any use for her beginning now she did not even remember the simple words of the little prayer she had been used to say with mattie at her mother's knee it was all forgotten she knew there was a god in heaven although she had always laughed and mocked at religion deeming it only fit for tiresome children and old women surely there was more in it than this she knelt down and stretched out her hands with a yearning look as though some voice in the skies would surely speak to her then she could not remember how it happened the fragrance of the flowers seemed to grow too strong for her the glass roof the green climbing plants the brilliant blossoms seemed to fall on her and crush her with a long low cry she fell with her face on the ground a streaming mass of radiant white and golden hair it was there that going in an hour afterward early found her and raising her from the floor thought at first that she was dead great was the distress great the consternation servants came hurrying in the doctor was sent for the earl and the countess returning were driven half frantic by the sight of that white face and silent figure it hardly reassured them to hear that it was only a fainting fit brought on what asked the earl in a fever of anxiety nothing more than the reaction after too great physical fatigue replied the doctor the lady doris looks stronger than she really is the best advice i can give is that she should leave london at once and have some weeks of perfect rest in the country medicine is of no use lady linleigh quite agreed in this view of the subject and the earl declared impetuously that they should go at once to-morrow if she is better he said i should not like such another fright that evening when lady doris lay on the little couch in lady linley's boudoir and early sat by her side he said to her what caused the sudden illness my darling did anything frighten you no i was only tired early tired i am beginning to dread the word do you know what they told me doris no she replied looking at him with frightened eyes what is it one of the servants said that she was quite sure that she heard someone talking to you in the conservatory but when i went in you were quite alone had anyone been there what nonsense she cried evasively time and experience had taught her that it was foolish to risk the truth recklessly i thought it was a mistake said loyal early who would be likely to be with you there when you had reserved the morning for me she closed her tired eyes and said to herself how thankful she should be when all this was over end of chapter seventy recorded by gabby cowan section seventy one of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 71 The Earl Reluctantly Ascends. Three days later, they were once more at Linley Court. The Earl could hear of no opposition he ruthlessly broke all engagements sacrificed all interest and pleasure his daughter's health he said must be paramount with him 
and so it was. The only drawback was that Early could not go. He might run down for two or three days, but until Parliament broke up he could not be away for very long. The Earl and the Countess were amused to see how both lovers felt the separation. Thank heaven, said Lady Stell. How, Ulrich, you do not know how I thank heaven that our child loves early. Did you ever doubt it, my lovely, sentimental darling? said Lord Linley. I was not sure. I was always more or less afraid, said the Countess. She spoke so lightly of love but now she seems very fond of early i do not think the woman is born who could help loving early said lord linleigh he is the finest noblest man i know she shows her good taste in loving him she will be very happy said lady estelle with tears in her eyes she will be one of the happiest women in the world and i am so grateful for it ulrich it might have been also different for the poor child. Lord Linley looked thoughtfully at her. Do you know, Estelle, I have an idea that Doris is very much changed. Have you noticed it? She seemed to me much fonder of early and not so strong as she was. I have not noticed any other difference. Then it must be my fancy. She has seemed to me more thoughtful at times even sad then strangely reckless a strange idea has come to me do you think she has any secret connected with that former lonely life of hers i do not think so replied lady estelle growing very pale that was a strange notion of yours my dear sending her there still those good people seem to have done their best for her i believe said lady estelle hastily that she was quite as safe as she would have been under my own roof i think i have noticed what you mean a nervous kind of uncertainty and dread but i am quite sure it is not because of any secret ulrich it is rather because she has been overtaxed I remember speaking to her about it some time since. She will soon be well now. Lady Estelle was right. Away from that terrible incubus, the dread of meeting the man she feared and detested, away from his baneful influence, she speedily recovered health and spirits. The dainty color flushed back in her lovely face. Her eyes grew radiant sweet snatches of song came from her lips she was once more the bright gay doris whose winsome smiles and charms had won all hearts lady linley laughed at her fears and for a short time all was happiness at linley court early came down for a few days and then the wedding day was fixed it was to be on the tenth of august and when the wedding was over they were to go right away until lady doris had recovered her usual strength it was not until afterward that early remembered how strange it was that she should have hurried on the wedding when he came to think it over he found that it was so it was doris who planned and arranged everything he had but acquiescence he had not been the prime mover in it so it was settled the tenth of august not many more weeks of suspense and anxiety not much more dread her revenge and her love would be gratified alike she should be early's wife on the tenth on the twentieth when lord vivian came she should be far away with early to protect her early to shield her it would be useless to pursue her then even if he did his worst and betrayed her she did not care her position would be secure oh it would be such glorious revenge to find her married after all his solemn oaths that she should be his wife and belong to no other either to him or to death i will deceive him to the very last she thought i will delude him until the very hour which sees me early's wife 
she bent all her energies to this it was easy enough to win from early a promise of total silence it was not quite so easy to win that same promise from the earl and countess she did win it though on that same evening that early left a superb night in june when the stars were gleaming in the skies and the night air was heavy with sweet odours lord and lady linleigh had gone out into the grounds the evening was far too beautiful to be spent indoors and she followed them they were sitting under the great drooping beeches watching the loveliness of that fair summer night the same thought struck both of them as doris came to them that neither starlight nor moonlight had ever fallen on so fair a figure as this her long dress of white sweeping silk trailed over the long grass she wore fragrant white lilies on her breast and in her golden hair she might have been the very spirit of starlight from her fair picturesque loveliness she went up to them and bending down to kiss lady linleigh's hand she knelt on the grass at their feet you are alone she said the two arbiters of my destiny i am so glad for i have a favour a grace to ask it is granted before it is asked said the countess but lord linleigh laughed no he said that could hardly be wise we cannot allow that she raised her face to his and he saw how earnest it was in its expression of pleading and prayer dear papa she said gently you must not refuse me this i will not my darling if it be in reason he replied early told me that you and he had arranged our wedding day for the tenth of august she continued dear papa dear lady linleigh i want you to promise that it shall be kept a profound secret for the whole world my dear tories cried the countess it is quite impossible said the earl besides i see no reason for such a thing why should you want it so it is possible she said i have been with you long enough to know that with you everything is possible why i wish it done it is my whim my folly my secret if you will i really do not see began the earl but she laid one soft white hand on his lips let me show you papa let me hear your objections and vanquish them one by one to begin with your train of bridesmaids they should be invited papa she interrupted i want none i will have none only mattie my foster sister let her come no one else then the marriage settlements said the perplexed earl they can be arranged with all possible secrecy if you only say one word to your lawyers but the bishop and the marriage my dear doris it is impossible impracticable ridiculous i am sure that you will be sorry papa if you refuse me and something in her voice struck the earl with keen anxiety have you any secret sensible reason for what you ask doris he said gravely the old suspicion that there had been something strange in his daughter's life coming back to him with double force i have my own fancy papa do not thwart it do not oppose me now that i am so soon to leave you you will always be pleased to think how much of my own way you have given me in this instance let her do as she will ulrich said lady linleigh it would be cruel to refuse her listen to my idea first papa this is the sort of wedding i should like you of course can please yourself whether you let me have it or not i should like no one except mattie to know anything about it in advance of the day i should like my wedding also to be as magnificent and grand as you please all ordered arranged and prepared to be kept in london ready for me so that i may select what i want to take abroad with me 
Then I should like Earle to come on the 8th, as though he were coming for an ordinary visit. On the 9th, I should be quite willing for you to tell the servants in the house, so that wedding, favors, flowers, and wedding breakfast can be prepared. Then, early on the morning of the 10th, I should like to drive over the old church at Anderley with Earle. Mattie and you, Lady Linley, if she will come, no one else. Then to be married in that pretty church, where the morning sun always shines so brightly, and then go away with Earle. No pealing of bells, no jewels, no showers of wedding presents, no pomp, no bishop, with assistant ministers, no ceremony, no grandeur. That is just what I should like, papa. I never heard such an extraordinary idea in all my life, said the earl. I do not know what to answer. I should like you to have your own way, but such a wedding for an earl's daughter is unheard of. Yes, it is different to Hanover Square. Miles of white satin and lace, bishops, bells, jewels, carriages, friends, and all that kind of thing. I know it is quite different. But let me have my own way, papa, please. Pray intercede for me, Lady Linley. The countess turned to her husband. Let it be so, Ulrich, she said. He was silent. He could have refused altogether, but for the uncomfortable suspicion haunting him that she had some painful though hidden motive, and that it was connected with that past life of hers, of which he knew so little. But for that he would have laughed the whole idea to scorn. My dear Doris, I cannot understand. Most ladies look upon their wedding as the crowning ceremony of their lives, the grandest event that can possibly happen to them, the very opportunity for a display of splendor and magnificence. I know they do, she replied gently. Then, as her hands clasped his, he felt her shudder as though cold. She raised her face and kissed him. She clasped her white arms round his neck. Papa, she cried, although I am your own child, I have never been much to you. The best part of my life has been spent away from you. I have never seen my mother's face. She is not here to plead to you for me. I shall have gone away from you, and altogether you will have known but little of me. I hope heaven will send you other children to love and bless you. But, Papa, do not refuse my prayer. In the after years, when I am far away, and perhaps a fair-haired son stands pleading where I stand, pleading now, you will like to remember that you yield to my prayer, that you granted me the greatest favor it was in your power to grant. The earl looked down. Lady Linley was weeping bitterly. You hear, Ulrich, she said in a low, passionate voice. You hear. She says she has no mother to plead for her. Let me plead in the mother's place. Do what she asks. I never did anything so unwillingly in all my life, said the earl. It is unheard of, inconsistent, ridiculous, in the highest degree. But I cannot refuse the prayer of my wife and my child. It must be as you wish. He saw, even in the starlight, the expression of relief that came over the beautiful, restless face. You promise, then, said Doris, and you too, Lady Linley, that you will not tell to any creature living, except Mattie Brace, when I am to marry, whom am I to marry, or anything about it? I promise, said Lady Estelle. And I too, repeated the Earl, although it is sorely against my better judgment my will, my common sense, and everything else. Never mind, papa, said Lady Doris. You have made me very happy. But even then, as she spoke, the tragedy was looming darkly over her. End of chapter 71 Recorded by Gaby Cowan
Section 72 of A Fair Mystery. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 72 The Countess Becomes Curious. We ought to be very much flattered, said Lord Linley with a smile, as he laid an open letter before his wife. When did we leave London? In June. It is only the middle of July, yet some of our friends are growing weary for us. It was such a July morning as makes the dwellers in cities ill with envy, when the earth hangs like a huge shining jewel in the firmament of heaven, a morning when life seems the greatest luxury, when to breathe and to live is a blessing without alloy. The sky was dark blue, without even one little white cloud to obscure it. It looked so far off, so much further than when low-lying clouds touched the earth. The sun was golden bright, warm without intense heat, and the air, ah, well, it would require a poet to tell how balmy and soft it was, how it came over the meadows laden with the breath of sweet clover, how it came from the woods with the odor of wild hyacinths, how it came from the gardens with the fragrance of rose and of lily with the fragrance of every flower that blows. Then it was filled with soft, delicious thrills, with the cooing of the ring doves and the song of the lark. Nature was in her happiest mood. The Earl and Countess had come down early to breakfast. The long windows were open. The perfumed air came in. They smiled as among the letters they saw one from early to doris he writes every day said lord linley quite right said lady estelle i like to see lovers deeply in love they smiled again when fresh and fair as the morning itself doris came down her face flushed when she saw the letter a sweet dewy brightness came into her eyes she laid it aside as though waiting for time. Read your letter, Doris, said Lady Linley, and the girl opened it. Ah, well, perhaps life doesn't hold a greater pleasure than reading a passionate love letter on a bright summer morning. Her dainty color deepened as she read. The light grew brighter in her eyes. My love! thought the girl, how he loves me. And with the fragrant breath of the summer morning, with the light of the blue skies, with the song of the birds, there came to her a pang of regret that she was so utterly unworthy of this great pure love, that her soul was so terribly stained by crime. Then she said to herself that she would atone for it, that she would, to the very best of her power, make up for it, that she would be so loving, so tender, so true, he should never have cause to regret it, for it was such a love letter as would have touched any girl's heart, written with the fire of a poet and of a lover. She lost herself in a daydream, in a golden trance of happiness, it was coming so near, this wedding day which was to bind her to early forever and free her from all care. It was Lady Linley's voice that roused her, and she was asking, What friend is coming? Who is coming, Ulrich? Lord Vivian. He does not say how long he intends remaining. There is the letter. Read it. But the countess was preparing a cup of fragrant tea after the fashion she liked best, and Lord Linley, seeing that, said, I will tell you about it, Estelle. 
Lord Vivian says he shall be passing through Anderley on his way to Leeson, and he should very much like to spend a few days with us. I can but answer in the affirmative, I suppose. Certainly, it will be a change for you. You have been very quiet lately. We can have a picnic and a dinner party while he is here. Lord Linley glanced with a shrewd smile at his daughter. It did not seem to him wonderful that his lordship should be passing through Anderley. The only pity was that it was all in vain. But he did not see his daughter's face. It was turned from him. The love letter had fallen from her hands. The golden light had faded from the skies. The beauty of the morning had vanished. Her face grew pale. Her eyes darkened. Why was he coming? Whatever might be the reason, it meant mischief to her. She was sure of it. He had promised not to come near her until the end of August. Then he was to come for her answer. What was bringing him now? I must bear it. I have to live it through, she said to herself, no matter what it may be. In a dumb passion of despair, she heard Lady Linley ask when he was coming. He will be here by the end of the week, said the earl carelessly, then laughed a little. Why are you laughing? asked Lady Estelle. My dear Estelle, I am just thinking how eagerly you seized upon his coming as an excuse for a little gaiety, he replied. You who assure me so seriously you prefer quiet and solitude, Lady Estelle blushed. I plead guilty, Ulrich, she said. It must be because I am very happy myself that I like to see everyone else happy too. They both wondered why Lady Doris was so silent. It must be from sheer excess of happiness, thought the countess. Lord Linley asked, Will you drive with me this morning, Doris, or would you prefer to ride or walk? Will you go with me? asked Lady Estelle. I am going to the street, though. No, thank you, papa. Thank you, Lady Linley. I am going to spend the morning in the gardens. That means writing a long letter too early, said Lord Linley with a smile. She did not contradict him, and Lady Estelle, when she kissed her and bade her good morning, thought how beautiful it was to be young, happy, and in love. Doris went out. There was the shade of fragrant trees, the brilliant colors of a thousand flowers, and Doris saw and heard nothing. She was full of despair. Why is he coming? she cried passionately. Just as I was growing so happy, learning to forget him and his terrible threats, why is he coming? It is like the serpent stealing into paradise. Oh, heaven, if I could but undo that unhappy past. Standing there in the sunshine, with every blessing from heaven lavished upon her, more according to outward appearances, to be envied than any girl in England, she saw the great canker warm of her life in its true colors. Sin had spoiled all for her. Sin, why? She could remember when, in the innocence of her youth and beauty, she had laughed at the word sin. She had scoffed at it. What did sin matter? She had said to herself. The only thing was to make the very best of life, to enjoy it with all her power to grasp its pleasures before they had time to fade. Sin, why, it was so sheer nonsense. Now, when sin had found her out, when its black trail had entered her life and poisoned it, when its consequences pursuing her were leading her to shame and disgrace, she began to recognize it for what it was. She said to herself that if she could begin life over again, she would be quite different. She would try to be good, like Mattie. 
she would think less of her own beauty and if the same temptation came to her again which had been so artfully offered her once she would refuse it she wished with all her heart that she had turned a deaf ear to lord vivian's entreaties i did no it was wrong she said to herself with unusual candor i had enough of what was good in me to know that and i am sorry really sorry that i did it who knows how much repentance the father above requires from a soul who shall measure his mercy the terrible tragedy was drawing nearer and it might be that the sorrow which rose from the poor weak vain soul that morning was sufficient to save it so she lived the time through until lord vivian came she was glad that lady linleigh had arranged for a little gaiety meeting him alone would have been simply unendurable as it was she met him in a drawing-room half crowded with guests he found time and opportunity for saying a few words to her how beautiful you look dora i have never seen you looking so well i should be flattered at pleasing such fastidious states as yours she replied yes you do look most lovely those waves of green and white and the water lilies in your hair you look like undine before or after she had found her soul she asked with a mocking smile he laughed that low light laugh for which she hated him i have never quite made up my mind as to whether women have souls or not he said i am inclined to think not if they have they certainly make queer use of them lady linleigh cried the girl to the countess who was just passing by what do you imagine lord vivianne says i cannot imagine replied the countess with a smile he says he is inclined to believe women have no souls or if they have they make queer use of them the countess looked slightly shocked lord vivianne gave one angry look at the spoiled beauty that is a very dreadful opinion to hold my lord said lady estelle lady studleigh is hardly just to me he replied she tells you what i say but she does not tell you although she knows what led me to form that opinion the countess looked quickly from one to the other with a grave intentness that did not escape either there was something more than mere bad nash in this something which she did not at all understand then lady doris saw that she had made a mistake in trying to expose him she must not play with edge tools lady linleigh left them not feeling quite satisfied why should he speak in that contemptuous manner of women to a woman who was so young so beautiful it was not chivalrous it was not even gentlemanly and lady doris manner puzzled her too it was as though she wished to expose lord vivianne to make others think evil of him she could not forget the little circumstance yet it must be a fancy of mine she thought they have so seldom met they know so little of each other there can be nothing but the most commonplace acquaintance between them still it made her curious and she purposely selected lord vivianne to take her down to dinner in order that she might after a little diplomatic fashion of her own question him how do you think lady studleigh is looking she asked him when they had a chance for a few quiet words she was not well at all when we left london i think her looking as beautiful as it is possible for any one to look he replied and as well i am glad you think so it must have been a great privation for her to leave london in the very midst of the season or i should say in the midst of a brilliant finale yes i do not remember of late years any one who created such a furor as lady studleigh 
was his reply. You met her often during the season? Yes, I met her very frequently. It was impossible to go much into society without doing so. She was an unusual favorite. The countess saw plainly that if he admired her, he was not going to say so. She would not be able to get at his real opinion. Yet the very caution of his words and manner, the restraint in his speech, the guarded expression of his face, all told her that she was right in her half-formed fancy. There was something unusual, either on his part or hers, which she could not make out. She would not devote more time to him that evening. The guests were numerous and must be entertained. The gentlemen did not remain long in the dining room, and the drawing room presented a beautiful picture. The lamps were all lighted and shone like huge pearls among the countless flowers. The gay dresses and shining jewels of the ladies seemed to shine with unwonted luster. The sweet summer evening was so warm and so fragrant. The rich silken hangings were drawn and the long windows were open, and from them the countess saw a fairy land of moonlight and flowers. I wish we had some music, said the earl. It only wants that to complete the enchantment, Doris. Will you sing? She went to the piano, and the rich voice floated through the room. Many who saw her then never forgot her. The green and white dress floating round her, the water lilies in her golden hair, a flush of beautiful face, while the rich voice poured out such a strain of melody as few had ever heard equalled. They who saw her then and knew what followed did not forget the picture. End of chapter 72 Recorded by Gaby Cowan Section 73 of A Fair Mystery This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org Recording by Gaby Cowan A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay Chapter 73 A Last Vain Appeal The night is so fine, said the earl. You young people would enjoy a short time on the lawn. Look at those lilies asleep in the moonlight. Go and wake them. Then we will have the card tables, that is, as it should be cards for the old, moonlight for the young. That was the very chance Lord Vivian had been longing for. He did not think he could bear suspense much longer. Now he was sure of a tete a tete. Here, in these rooms half filled with people, it had been an easy matter to avoid him, or to make others join in the conversation. It could not be as easy out there in the moonlight. Lady Linley, who had never for one moment relaxed her keen, untiring watch, saw him go up to Lady Doris and speak a few words to her in a low voice. At first the beautiful face flushed hotly, and the bright eyes seemed to flash, out of a proud defiance. Then there was an expression of half-startled fear followed by one of submission most unusual in her there is a mystery she said to herself there is something between him and my darling the mother's first impulse was to screen her to help her lady lindley crossed the room and went to her doris she said in a clear distinct voice that all might hear doris do not go if you prefer remaining here the girl raised her eyes to the calm gentle face and lady linley was shocked to see tears in them thank you she said calmly i shall enjoy going out who could resist the moon and the flowers then do not remain long 
You look tired, and we must remember you are not strong. Lord Vivianne joined them. Lady Studley has graciously promised to show me the fountains by moonlight. I will watch her faithfully, and at the first symptom of fatigue, I promise you she shall return. Then the countess could say no more. She saw Lord Vivian carefully draw the black lace shawl over the white neck and arms. Not that you can be cold, he said, in reply to some objection, but, as Lady Linleigh says, we must be careful of you. And he smiled down on her with an air of protection and of appropriation, for which she in her rage could have struck him dead and which made lady linleigh wonder exceedingly it is ten thousand pities she thought that he does not know she is engaged too early then a new suspicion came to her which made her even more uncomfortable was it possible that her daughter's passionate desire for secrecy had anything to do with lord vivian was her daughter afraid of letting him know that she was going to be married? The very torment of the suspicion, faint as it was, filled her with dread. Then she saw the happy little group of guests on the lawn. She caught one glimpse of the white water lilies and green dress as Lady Studley disappeared with her cavalier. What has come over me? said the countess. I have a presentiment, heavy as death. What can be wrong? I shall begin to think I am growing old and fanciful. What danger can be near my darling? She set herself resolutely to play at whist, but every now and then her partner saw her turn pale and shudder, as though she were cold. Doris and Lord Vivian were out in the moonlight together and alone at last at first they maintained complete and perfect silence lord vivian placed the white jewel hand on his arm she did not make the least objection it was all useless she was in his power and she knew it she would not even ask the question that trembled on her lips and filled her with despairing wonder what had brought him there she walked by his side, silent, proud, and uncomplaining. My darling, he said at last, does not this evening remind you of Florence and the moonlight on the river? If I am to talk to you, Lord Vivian, and it seems I am compelled to do so, I must ask you to refrain from using such expressions as darling. I will not answer you if you do. They are utterly hateful to me. Yet I remember the time when they pleased you passing well. Do you remember, Dora, when I gave you a diamond ring? You have diamonds now on your neck and arms, in your ears and your hair. They shine like fire rivers over your beautiful figure. You are so accustomed to them that they have ceased to have any particular value for you. But do you remember your delight in the first women remember their first diamonds as they do their first long dress or their first lover she replied i suppose so oh dora be a little kind to me we are here in this sweet moonlight together yet you do not give me one word one smile you were not always so hard or so cruel in Florence you used to walk with both these beautiful white hands clasped over my arm. Do you remember it? Then she raised to his a face that, in its pride and anger, he never forgot. I will not permit you to mention those days to me, she cried. They are hateful. The very memory of them brands me as with a red-hot iron. I will not bear it. I would sooner listen to me. I know the words are unwomanly. I would sooner pass through the infernal tires than go to Florence with you again. He laughed. I like to see you in a passion, Dora. It suits you. 
you would have made a grand tragedy queen i do not wish to vex you or to tease you because as you know i wish to make you my wife do you know can you guess what has brought me here no you have broken our compact in coming i know that still it was the question over which she had pondered by day and by night ever since she had heard he was coming it made her heart beat fast but she would not give way there was not the least sign of emotion do you not wonder what has brought me here dora he repeated i am very indifferent she said no one could be more so i will tell you i came to see if you were keeping faith with me if there was any rumour of a lover any rumour of an engagement I came purposely for that. And if there had been, she said, if there had been, why, you see, Dora, matters would have turned out very awkwardly for both of us. You are satisfied that there is not? Yes, tolerably so. There is no lover here. I hear of none in the neighborhood, and you are not engaged to be married. That I do know how do you know because i have made inquiries in the proper direction i am i may say quite satisfied he could not tell the sensation of intense relief that came over her the wild throbbing of her heart she was safe then so far and could marry early half of the dread and fear she had felt faded away from her i own continued lord vivian that i have suspected you unjustly you deceived me once and i fancied that you intended to deceive me again you eluded me once you will not elude me again you thought i was going to do so i thought your manner is strange your leaving london in the height of your triumph is strange your coming to this quiet though beautiful country home is strange i told you that i wanted time for reflection she said yes and even that when i came to think of it was strange of course i shall keep my word now that i have given it but why should you how can you need time for reflection the idea is utterly absurd you cannot for a moment hesitate between my threat and my offer but i do hesitate she said incredible as it may seem to you he looked in her face so fair and calm in the moonlight and so proud i wish you would tell me why you hesitate he said i will i dislike you so much the idea of having to spend my life with you is so utterly abhorrent to me that i hesitate between that and the total ruin that would follow my refusal you must indeed dislike me he said if you prefer ruin shame and disgrace to me i do will you tell me why he asked i should have thought both answer and question useless why to begin with you tempted me to sin and shame by flattering my vanity and my pride you did not really require much temptation lady studley thank you you are as generous as you are gentlemanly granted that i did not require much temptation you placed what little i did want before me do you not see she cried with sudden passion that you have spoiled my life it would be bright hopeful full of charm but for you you have marred and blighted it i do not like you i never did the very way in which you won me was hateful to me your love was all self i never liked you and now when i could be happy oh heaven so unutterably happy you come like a black shadow and rub my life off every bit of happiness that it contains no wonder that i loathe you no he said gently it is not then why do you not be kind to me and let me be quite free she asked emboldened by the softening of his voice you have guessed the reason he replied you have said 
it is because i am selfish to my heart's core i sacrificed you once to my selfish love is it likely that i should hesitate a second time you might well hesitate because i suffered so keenly over the first the red flush deepened on his face a strange light came into his eyes i will not let you go free neither will i cease from my endeavours to make you my wife and the reason is because i love you oh proud fair lovely woman i love you with the very madness of love with a desperation of the fiercest passion with a love that is my doom and yours you have heard of men made desperate through love look at me you will see it i will kill you if you attempt to leave me if you attempt to give the love that ought to be mine to another man thank you for the threat she said you drive me to threats you give me no other recourse i would fain be all that is kind and good to you i would worship you i would lay all that i have at your feet only begging of you to take it what could i not do to prove you how dearly i love you it is all self we will have the plainest possible understanding if there be any manhood in you it shall be shamed you shall have it in plain words you quite understand that if ever i should marry you it would be because by threats you had compelled me to do so that i should hate and detest you if i became your wife even more than i hate and detest you now as the days passed on my loathing would become greater so that no friendly word would ever pass between us and i should consider you simply as a tyrant who bound me in chains you understand all this i will risk it he replied i should not despair of regaining your love in time the face she turned to him was pallid in its despair you never would regain it she said calmly yet there is one way in which even now you might gain my liking my esteem my sincere friendship his face kindled at the words how dora tell me how he cried eagerly by saying to me you are free i took advantage of your youth and innocence i am sorry for it you are free forgive me the wrong that has been done and let us be friends if you could do that lord vivian even now i should like you with a warm true liking he was silent for a few minutes her appeal had touched him greatly looking at him she saw that his face had softened impulsively she laid a warm soft hand on his i never thought to use words of persuasion to you she said i never thought to plead or to pray to you but i do so now be kind to me and let me go free he was tempted for one minute but that warm soft hand crept like fire through his veins his pulses thrilled his heart beat give her up this fair woman whose beauty maddened him no never never come what might i could not release you dora i could not give you up if every angel and every fiend combined tried to take you from me End of chapter 73 Recorded by Gabby Cowan Section 74 of A Fair Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Gabby Cowan A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter seventy four. Heaven, say fairly. August at last, said Lady Linley. It is the first day, not long now, Doris, until the ten. No, not long, was the reply. Everything is ready and waiting at Hyde House. 
continued the countess the whole of your trousseau is ready and a more magnificent one was never designed i am more than satisfied with it said the young beauty what time will mattie brace be here lady linleigh about noon i shall send the carriage to the station i will drive my pretty ponies said doris eagerly i have only used them once since papa gave them to me she will be so pleased if i meet her it is well thought of my dear said lady estelle doris do you know what i have done no something kind and nice like yourself i know by the sound of your voice i have ordered a very nice little trousseau for mattie dresses that will not be unsuited to her at home yet will do for her to wear here i shall be so lonely when you are gone that i thought of asking her to remain here i shall miss you so much doris and i shall miss you dear lady linleigh i never thought when you came home to my father's house that i should learn to love you so dearly lady linleigh clasped her arms around the girl's neck tell me one thing she said caressingly do you think i have been as kind to you as your own mother would have been i do not think dear lady linleigh i am quite sure she replied it is an odd fancy of mine said the countess with a wistful smile but i have always been so fond of children i have such a longing to hear a child call me mother doris you will have left me in ten days will you kiss me and say heaven bless you my own mother of course i will heaven bless you my own dear mother you have been one to me you have helped me in every little trouble and perplexity you have been kind to me without ceasing why lady linleigh your face is wet with tears is it darling i feel you're going away so much but we must not remain talking here if you wish to drive to the station it is high time the ponies were brought around and i myself wish to see that everything is as she will like it in mattie's room the warmer days of the golden summer had passed away rapidly it was the first of august and the marriage was to be on the tenth so great and entire had been the secrecy preserved that no creature in that vast establishment knew anything at all about it the servants and every one else thought that mattie was simply coming for her yearly visit but that the wedding of their young lady was on the tapis no one for a moment suspected lord vivian had not made a very long stay at linleigh court matters were not very pleasant for him there lady linleigh seemed suddenly to have grown very observant and he found but few opportunities of speaking to doris after his impassioned violent words on that evening she had made no answer the rapture and tenderness had all died from her face a hard fixed look came in her eyes let the words come now she said it will serve him right she pleaded and prayed no more and it was well for him that he could not read the thoughts that were in her mind he poured out such a torrent of passionate words she heard none of them after a time she said i think we have been out quite long enough lord vivian we will return if you please when they reached the lawn again where the ladies with their attendant cavaliers were enjoying the fair sweet night he suddenly took her right hand and kissed it i shall hope to make this mine one day he said she snatched it from him with sudden violence and it struck the trunk of a tree with such terrible force that he thought she had broken it i will cut my hand off she said if you touch it again he was startled by her vehemence you do indeed hate me dora 
he said sadly. I do indeed, was the reply. And then they saw Lady Linleigh walking across the lawn to them. My dear Doris, her ladyship cried, what is the matter, darling? See, you have a great stain of blood on your dress and your hand. What has happened? She took the white hand with its purple bleeding bruise into her own. What is the matter, Doris? Lord Vivian, what is the matter? She saw that he looked dreadfully distressed. Dear Lady Linleigh, it is nothing, said Lady Doris quickly, fearing that he would speak. I was resting against the gate there, and I thought something was on my hand. A snake crawled over it, a horrible, slimy snake, and in my hurry I bruised it against the gate. That is all. But, said the countess perplexedly, Lord Vivian was with you. Oh, yes, he was there. I was there, Lady Linley, and I am terribly distressed over the accident. But Lady Studley was too quick for me. Before I could assure her that there was nothing the matter, she had flung her hand so violently that I thought she had broken it. There was no snake. There could not be, said the countess. I have never heard of any snakes at Linley. Give me your hand, child. What a terrible bruise! The countess took her injured hand and gently bound it, little dreaming how it had been hurt. After that, Lord Vivienne had been very much subdued. Such an excess of hatred startled him. He could not realize it. He was half alarmed at the violence of the passion he had evoked. Still, no idea of yielding came to him. As he watched her day after day, her beauty, her grace, grew more and more enchanting to him. It was not so much love as madness that possessed him. Lie could not have relinquished his hold or have given her up to have saved his life. During the remainder of his stay, the countess kept keen, unwavering watch over him but he had learned his lesson after what he had seen how little she recked of physical pain how careless she was of herself he dared not to venture to tease her he felt that she was quite capable of committing murder if he drove her too far he contented himself by saying to her when he was going it is understood between us then lady studley that i return on the twentieth of august for your decision it is quite understood she replied with calm dignity i hope it will be a favourable one to me and i hope my reception will be kinder next time than it has been this you will always be welcomed according to your deserts she replied i hope above all the poor bruised hand will be better when i come again he said with a meaning smile and that you will not find any more snakes in those beautiful moonlit grounds it be as well for the snakes to keep away she said when he went the little current of gaiety that had come with him died away altogether lady linley was relieved when he had gone without knowing what to suspect she suspected something she felt like someone walking on the brink of a volcano but when he was gone and a few days had passed without anything happening she felt relieved she had not forgotten the incident of the bruised hand although everything else might be fancy that was not when lord vivian bade the earl good-bye he said i have enjoyed my visit very much lord linley so much that if i should return by the same route about the end of august i shall beg permission to repeat it the earl most cordially assured him that he would be welcome and so the bright summer days had worn away to lady doris each one brought a fresh sensation of relief the tent was drawing near. 
lord vivian was still in utter and profound ignorance of all that was transpiring she would be married and away when he came back how she enjoyed the thought of his discomfiture she laughed aloud as she thought of his impotent anger he may do as he likes then she said i shall be earle's wife my fortune will be settled on me and i shall defy him if he tells his story then he will not find many to believe him early will not believe anything against his wife i am sure i must bribe some respectable family to say that i lived with them as governess in florence i shall conquer the difficulty when i am once married to early this was her one haven of refuge her rock her safe harbour from all storms the end which she so ardently desired to gain the one great object in life that she proposed for herself it seemed to her almost be well then she had written to mattie asking her to come to linley on the first of august but so desirous was she of keeping her own secret that she had not told her what for and she did not tell her until they were driving in the pretty pony carriage back to the court then she was so eager to tell her story that she did not notice how pale the brown face had grown or how the dark eyes looked full of unshed tears so you have sent for me doris to be your bridesmaid said mattie you who might have some of the noblest and highest ladies in the land there could be none that i love like you mattie we were sisters for years you know then mattie was silent for a little time she said to herself at first that if she had known why doris wanted her she would not have gone she would rather have done anything have suffered anything than seen early married then she reproached herself for being selfish and tried to throw all her heart and soul into her sister's plans lady doris wondered why mattie suddenly kissed her face and said heaven bless you my darling i hope you will be very happy i should think doris that you are the happiest girl in all the world yes said doris i think i am and she added to herself bitterly good to heaven i were the countess was more than kind to mattie in her own mind she was always thinking how to pay back to mark brace's daughter the kindness they had shown doris when the two young girls stood together in lady doris's dressing-room she drew off her driving gloves and laid them on the table then for the first time mattie saw the terrible bruise on the white hand she bent down to look at it what have you done to your pretty hand doris she asked what a frightful bruise i knocked it against something was the vague reply but mattie saw the burning flush on her sister's face what a pity now you will be married with a black dreadful looking bruise on your hand that will not get well in ten days sometimes i think it will never get well at all mattie said lady doris it has been done some weeks already i forget how long mattie kissed the dark skin and lady doris shuddered as she remembered whose lips had rested on that hand before when is early coming she asked and lady doris answered on the eighth he cannot leave london before you have no idea what a famous man he is becoming mattie she was glad to hear it yet the old familiar prayer rose to her lips without knowing why she said to herself heaven save early End of chapter seventy four Recording by Gabby Cowan Section 75 of A Fair Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Gaby Cowan. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 75. I shall wake up and find it a dream. The 8th of August. When had any day so beautiful shown before? It was as though the birds had woke earlier to sing. How the sun was shining and the flowers blooming. Lady Doris opened her eyes to the fairest and loveliest day that had ever dawned. Early is coming today, was her first thought. Early is coming, sung the birds. Early is coming, whispered the wind, as it stirred the sweet green leaves she had rested well for it seemed to her now that her troubles were nearly ended in two more days she would be his wife then who could touch her what evil could come to her early was to be at linleigh by noon the hours would roll so swiftly so sweetly by until then only two days she sung to herself sweet little snatches of love songs while she was dressing, she looked at herself in wonder. Could it be the same Doris who once thought nothing on earth of any value except money and grandeur? Could she have so mingled her love and life into another's as almost to have lost her own identity and to think of nothing except early? I never thought that I should be so much in love, she said to herself how strange it seems she did not quite understand herself it was not that she loved early so passionately the capability of great love was not hers it was not that it was that early the master mind had by the force and nobility of his own character completely influenced her and had won a complete ascendancy over her she had not much power of loving had she had was his but early represented peace happiness and prosperity to her early was her sure heaven of rest her shield against all evil her refuge against her direst enemy and bitter foe lord vivian so welcome bright sunny day welcome golden sun and sweet flowers the post brought her daily love letter but it was brief it said simply i cannot write so much to my darling i shall see her to-day and in two days more she will be mine until death part us he thought of the words when he saw them again every face wore its brightest look at the breakfast table that day the earl and countess were happy in their beautiful daughter's happiness mattie because she entered so easily into the joy of others doris said mattie will you come out we shall have just time for our stroll in the woods before early comes lady doris laughed i really cannot mattie the spirit of unrest is on me i cannot go anywhere or do anything until i have seen early have you decided yet about your wedding dress asked mattie this strange caprice of silence makes me afraid to speak but silence or not it is high time that it was seen about lady doris laughed i am so amused at myself mattie she said if anyone had ever told me some years even some months since that i should be quite indifferent over my wedding dress i would not have believed it but why are you indifferent asked mattie i cannot understand is it because you are not marrying a nobleman is it because you are marrying early no was the reply you can believe me or not mattie just as you please but i assure you i am more proud in marrying early than if i were marrying a king so i should imagine early is a king then why this strange desire for secrecy 
the beautiful eyes were raised wistfully to her face i may tell you perhaps some day mattie but not now dear not now you will marry some good kindly man mattie someone like yourself who never knew the fiery heat of temptation who has always kept as you have kept his eyes on heaven then some day dear when you are sitting with your little children around you i shall come to you world-worn and weary perhaps who knows longing to lay my head in the clover grass and then i may tell you all but not now then there is a secret said mattie gently yes was the wary reply there is a secret the words seemed half forced from her does early know it asked mattie no i never will do not talk to me dear you have been my sister many years and i love you very much if ever i seek a confidante it will be you you need not to be anxious over my wedding dress mattie lady linleigh has presented me with my trousseau and she tells me that no royal princess ever had a more sumptuous one she told me also that a box would come from paris to-day for you and for me rely upon it that it will contain my wedding dress how kind lady linleigh is to you said mattie i do not think your own mother could love you better i do not think she would love me half so much was the laughing reply then in the warm sunlit air they heard the sharp clank of the clock eleven he will be here in an hour said doris shall you not go and change your dress asked the simple little foster sister i thought great ladies always dressed very grandly to receive their lovers my dear mattie was the coquettish reply could i look better no she could not a white dress of indian muslin showed every curve and line of that beautiful figure it was open at the throat and a lovely rose nestled against the white breast it was relieved by dashes of blue and the long waving golden hair was fastened by a single blue ribbon no jewels no court attire no magnificence of dress ever became her as did this she looked young fresh and fair as the dawn of a bright spring morning no one looking at her could have guessed that the full canker of sin had entered that young heart and soul i am very happy here she continued languidly i am watching the butterflies and the flowers look at that one mattie with the gorgeous purple wings see now he hovers round that tall white lily then he goes away to the club carnations he does not know which to choose oh happy butterfly to have such a choice i wonder what it is like mattie to feel quite free from care they were seated under a group of white acacia trees on the lawn and with every breath of wind the fragrant blossoms fell in a sweet shower over them the sun shone on the rippling fountains on the fair flowers and on the faces of the two girls free from care repeated mattie with something like surprise why my darling if you are not free from care who is i was not speaking or even thinking of myself i was merely thinking how happy all kinds of birds and butterflies and flowers must be to enjoy the dew and the sunshine and the sweet winds happy but they have no soul doris she laughed a low bitter laugh that pierced mattie like the point of a sword huh a soul she repeated i am not sure that a soul brings happiness those who have souls have the responsibility of saving them doris you do not deserve to be happy for you are not good cried mattie and three days afterward 
she remembered the words with the keenest pain but lady doris was unusually gentle she bent down and kissed the kindly face i am not good but i am going to try to be better dear it seems to be part of my nature to say bad things i am not quite sure if i always mean them hark mattie i hear the sound of carriage wheels early is coming the beautiful face grew white in its intensity of feeling mattie rose from her seat he will like best she said to meet you alone i will tell him you are here it seemed to doris that the sun shone more golden the wind seemed to whisper more sweetly when she heard the sound of footsteps and the voice she loved so well the next moment strong loving arms were around her passionate kisses fell on her face lips and hands my darling cried early my wife so soon to be my wife it was one happy half hour stolen almost from paradise for he loved her so dearly he found heaven in her face and she was at rest at peace with him then lord linleigh and mattie came the earl with happy smiles and merry jest he was so glad in her joy love is very delightful he said but doris we must offer something substantial to a traveller suppose we substitute cold chicken and madeira then lady linleigh desired me to say that a most wonderful box had arrived from paris and she wanted you to unpack it then he bent down and kissed the fair face so dear to them all i can hardly believe that we are to lose you in two days my darling he said nor can i believe that i shall win her said early i often have the impression that i shall wake up and find it a dream and that early murray will be in the cornfields at home you are a poet laughed the earl and poets are not accountable for anything then they went together to lunch mattie knew that it was by lady linley's orders that the table was so gracefully ornamented with flowers and fruit the pretty thought was like her they spent perhaps one of the happiest hours of their lives together then lady linley said now for the parisian box early you must be banished while that is unpacked the ladies went together up to lady linley's room we will have no curious ladies maids or servants she said we will unpack this ourselves the key came to me this morning by a registered letter doris my dear the box and its contents are yours you shall unpack them lady studley took the key and opened it there were layers of fine white wading and tissue paper one by one lady doris raised the costly packets in her hands and laid them down there was a bright maid's costume all complete a marvel of pink and white silk with everything to match white silk shoes with little pink rosettes white bonnet that looked as though a puff of wind would blow it away and a costly pink plume gloves fan jewels all matched exactly and mattie's face grew radiant all this for me oh lady linley how am i to thank you by looking your prettiest in them laughed the countess as she placed the fairly like bonnet on the brown shining hair i thought pink would suit you mattie so it does see how nice she looks doris lady studley kissed her foster sister's face mattie always looks nice she said just as she always looks happy and good then came the bride's costume you would not allow the earl and myself to show that we felt your wedding to be the happiest event of our lives said lady linley but you could not prevent my intention of seeing you dressed as a bride such a wedding dress 
one of worth's most marvellous combinations of white satin and white lace a dress fit for a queen and it was trimmed so beautiful with wreaths of orange blossoms there in a pretty scented box lay the bridal veil such a wonder of lace so exquisitely worked large enough to cover a bride yet so fine and delicate that it could be drawn through a wedding ring then came the wreath of orange blossoms lady studleigh was accustomed by this time to splendour there was a little in the way of dress that could ever give her the agreeable sensation of surprise but she uttered a little cry of admiration as she saw the elegant costly presents the countess had arranged for her everything was complete and beautiful even to the little bouquet holder made of pure white pearls she took lady linley's hand and kissed them are you pleased my darling she asked gently oh lady linley you have left me without words quite without words i cannot thank you the countess bent her head could your own mother have pleased you more she asked no a thousand times no was the sincere reply then mattie said lady linley let us dress stories in her bridal robes so that early may see her and the countess laughed as she gave consent End of chapter seventy five recorded by gabby cowan section seventy six of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gabby cowan a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter seventy six trying on the wedding dress what does she look like cried mattie in a passion of admiration as they placed the bridal veil on the golden head it would require a poet to tell us said the countess and as we have one close at hand we will ask him mattie go and bring early here close the door after you i should not like everyone to know what we have been doing and presently early stood before a figure that seemed to him too beautiful to be real a tall graceful figure that seemed to rise from the waves of white satin and lace as a graceful flower from its stem through the bridal veil he caught the sheen of the golden hair the dainty colour of the face the deep colour of the violet eyes the sweet odour of orange blossoms floated to him doris he said in a low voice my beautiful love let me see your face it was lady linley who threw back the veil so that he might see the lovely blushing face tears stood in the young lover's eyes although he tried to control his emotion is it possible lady linley he asked that this is my wife that well i had better not say too much you do not think i shall wake up and find it all a dream no it is real enough then he drew nearer to her you will let me give you one kiss doris lady linley will not be horrified you will be lady murray soon what is my poor name worth that it should be so highly honoured he kissed her sweet lips i must be careful he said you look like a fairy perhaps you would vanish if a mere mortal touched you now let me look at you darling at your dress your veil and your wreath the picture is perfect i wish that i could put it into words he did afterward into words over which all england wept then for a few minutes the three lady linley mattie and early 
stood looking at her in silence they hardly knew why then early said when i see that pretty veil again it will be on the head of my beloved wife then they all three looked at the veil heaven help him he little dreamed how and when he should see it again if they could have had the faintest foreknowledge of that the tragedy might have been averted then early went away and the bridal robes were taken to lady linley's boudoir they will not be seen there said the countess i will lock the door and keep the key to-morrow it will not matter and mattie helped her poor helpless child placed them over a chair so that the shining robes might not be injured it was early who proposed a ramble to the woods dinner was to be later than usual let us all three go he said mattie with us stories it may be years before we meet all together so happy again so it was settled and they spent the remainder of that sunny happy day together they were sitting in a green sunny dell with the fall grass and wild flowers springing luxuriantly around them the tall trees spreading overhead the little birds filling the wood with song lady doris had never been so happy she had almost forgotten the dark background of sorrow and care mattie was happy for it was impossible to see them so young so loving with their graceful caresses and love without rejoicing with them this is like brackenside said early how often we have sat together in the woods there and mrs brace used to wonder how the farms would advance if they were left to us and well she might wonder said mattie even when i believed doris to be my own sister i thought her the most beautiful but the most useless of human beings thank you laughed lady stodley it is altogether like a fairy tale said early if i had read such a story i should say it was untrue i should call such a story exaggerated yet here we are the living breathing actors in the drama it is not such a very wonderful history early said lady studley there are many private marriages many children brought up in ignorance of the real name and station many a man like you a gentleman and genius by birth rises by the simple force of his own merit to be one of the magnates of the land then she sighed to herself and her brightness was for a moment overcast as she remembered that hers was the only part of the story that was improbably or extraordinary no one would believe that she had been guilty as she had been how often in after years they went back to that bright long day early never saw a wild flower or a green fern that he did not turn from it with a sick aching heart they dined together the earl would not have any visitors it was the last day but one of their darling and they would have it all to themselves there they sat in the gloaming and doris sang to them who knew the pain the aching in one lonely heart who knew the quiet heroism of the girl with the brown kindly face and shiny hair the lamps were lighted and lord linley laughing to think how they had all been engrossed drew a large parcel toward himself this shows he said that we have something unusual going on this packet of periodicals has been in the library for several days and no one has thought of opening it it is the first time such a thing has happened he unfastened the string and looked through them casually one however seemed to attract his attention it was beautifully illustrated and he laid it down with a smile 
read that, Doris," he said. "It contains a warning for you." "What is the warning, papa? I would rather take it from you than from print." "I have not read it. Look at the engraving. It is evidently the story of a bride who, on her wedding eve, dresses herself in her bridal robes girlish vanity, I suppose just to see how she looks. The wedding dress catches fire, and she is burned to death. Moral, young ladies should never try on their wedding dresses beforehand. What a tragical story, said the countess. I can never see the use of such stories, said Mattie. They make everyone sad who reads them. Burned to death on her wedding eve, said Early and all because she wanted to see if she should be charming enough in the eyes of her lover there is no poetic justice in that what was the heroine's name papa asked doris miriam dale i always notice that if a heroine is to come to any pathetic end she is called miriam did she love her lover very much asked doris read the story my dear said the earl indolently it is not much in my line the engraving caught my attention a beautiful frantic girl dressed in bridal robes and wreathed in flames there is something terrible about it doris rose from her seat and opened the book then after looking at the picture she laid it down with a long shuddering sigh stories often fail in poetic justice she said if that girl was young and innocent if she had done no wrong why should she have been killed on her wedding eve stories are after all but the sketches taken from life said the earl and life often seems to us short-seeing mortals to fail in poetic justice although no doubt everything is right and just in the sight of heaven doris is growing serious over it we tried her wedding dress on this morning but there was no fire near it and no harm came of it i am no believer in those stupid superstitions although i have heard it is unlucky to try on a wedding dress still i do not believe it will make one iota of difference how can it said early calmly and they all remembered that conversation a few hours afterward the ninth of august came and lord linleigh as they sat at breakfast said laughingly now for a sensation what will be said and thought by the different members of this establishment when it is known that there is to be a wedding tomorrow it passes my comprehension I promised to be patient, but it was almost cruel of you, Doris, to place me in such a predicament. I suppose I must call the principal servants together and tell them that Lady Studley is to be married tomorrow, without form or ceremony of any kind. There will be what the papers call a startling surprise. We have plenty to do, said the Countess. There will be no time for rambles in the wood. Ulrich, when you have made your announcement, will you go to the vicarage? You have arrangements to make there, and you must take early with you. I cannot spare Doris to him this morning. So the gentleman went away. It is a strange whim of Doris, this desire for secrecy, said the earl as they rode along. I must confess I do not understand it. Do you? Not in the least replied early she seemed very intent upon it i think lord linleigh he added with a laugh that i shall learn one thing as i grow older what will that be asked the earl not to try to phantom the caprice of ladies but to yield gracefully to it you are a wise man said lord linleigh with a look of sincere admiration that is the true secret of wedded content while lord linleigh and early were busy at the vicarage 
where it required some time and some persuasion to induce the rector to believe what they had to say the ladies were wonderfully busy the news spread as lord linley had foreseen caused a great sensation lady studley to be married to-morrow and such a marriage no ceremony no gaieties nothing at all lady linley had however considerably changed the state of affairs by saying that the arrangements for the wedding had been hurried so as to permit of lady doris going abroad in august and before going she intended making a handsome present to each member of the household their opinion was in consequence considerably changed when the earl and his household met at dinner there were much laughter and amusement much to tell the rector's amazement the astonishment of every one who heard the news the earl was in high spirits laughing and jesting all the more than he saw his wife's gentle face growing sad and sorrowful you will be gone this time to-morrow she said i shall fancy i hear your voice and see your face all day and for many long days yes doris said softly i shall be gone this time to-morrow but you will not be so very far away said mattie no further than london said early i like crossing the channel do you doris no i am not a good sailor she replied ladies seldom are said the earl still i have resolved doris last evening with us shall be the happiest she has spent at linley we will not have one sad word End of chapter seventy six recorded by gabby cowan section seventy seven of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gabby cowan a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter seventy seven a midnight visitor the evening was over at last and to doris it had been the happiest day perhaps of her life lord linley had sent to his cellars for some of his choicest wines wines that only saw daylight when the daughters of the house were married or its heirs christened wine that was like the nectar of the gods golden in hue fragrant of perfume and exhilarating as the water of life all traditions sink of he had ordered the dessert to be placed outside in the rose garden we will imitate the ancients he said we will drink our wine to the odor of sweet flowers so they sat and watched the golden sun set in the west it seemed to them it had never set in such glorious majesty before the sky was chrism and gold and purple the pale violet and pearly gleams shone out a soft veil seemed to shroud the western skies and then the sun had set lady doris had sat for some time watching the sun set in silence suddenly she said i shall never forget my last sunset your last sunset repeated early do you mean that you will never see it set again no i mean my last sunset at linley early if all those strange stories of heaven are true it must be a beautiful place and this fair sky with its gleaming colors is only the wrong side after all the faint light died in the west the flowers closed their tired eyes the lovely twilight reigned soft and fragrant the air grew almost faint with perfume from lily from rose from carnation then some bird 
evidently of erratic habits, began a beautiful vesper hymn, and they sat as though spellbound. A night never to be forgotten, said the earl. Doris, that little bird is singing your wedding song. If they could but have heard what the little bird was telling, a warning and a requiem both in one. Doris arose and went to the tree in whose branches the bird was hidden. She raised her face to see if she could see it in the thick green leaves. As she stood there in the light of the dying day, the earl said, You will have a beautiful wife, Early. They all looked at her as she stood there in a beautiful dress of shining white silk with a set of opals for ornaments. Her fair white arms and white neck were half shrouded in lace. Her golden hair was fastened negligently with a diamond arrow and hung in shining ripples over her shoulders. The faint light showed her face fair and beautiful as a bright star. You will have a beautiful wife, he repeated thoughtfully. As they all saw her then, they saw her until memory reproduced no more pictures for them. We have a fine moonlight night, said Early. Doris, this time tomorrow evening we shall be leaning over the steamboat side, watching the light in the water and the track of the huge wheels then you will be my wife lady lindley rose and drew her shawl round her shapely shoulders we must not forget to-morrow in the happiness of to-night she said it will not do to have a pale bride i am going in but first she went up to the tree where doris was standing it is rather a hopeless task, Doris, to look for a bird in the growing darkness, she said. And, my darling, I have to wish you good night. Doris turned to her, and bending her graceful head, laid it on her mother's shoulder. It is not only good night, but good-bye, she said. I shall hardly see you tomorrow. She clasped her warm, soft arms round the countess's neck. Goodbye, dearest Lady Lindley, she said. You have been very good to me. You have made home very happy for me. You have been like the dearest mother to me. Good night. May heaven bless you. Such unusual, such solemn words for her to use. The two fair faces touched each other. There was a warm, close embrace. Then Lady Linley went away. When did she forget that parting, or the last look on that face? I am jealous, said Lord Linley, parting the branches and looking at his daughter. I wanted the kindest good night. What has my daughter to say to me? It is my farewell, also. Tomorrow you will be Lady Murray. I shall be forgotten. Her heart was strangely touched and softened. Not forgotten by me, papa, she said. Next to Early, I shall always love you better than anyone in the world. Next to Early? Well, I must be content. That is enough. Good night, my dear and only child. May heaven send you a happy life. He too took away with him the memory of the sweet face and tender eyes a memory never to die he nodded too early i must be lenient he said and give you young lovers ten minutes longer i shall be in the library early come and smoke a cigar with me i have something to say to you mattie had gone to her room doris had promised to meet her there the little bird startled by the voices perhaps had ceased to sing and the lovers stood under the spreading tree alone. Ten minutes out here with you, my darling, said Early. It is like two years in paradise. How kind they are to us. Doris, how happy we shall be. 
but he had not many words he laid the golden head on his breast where he could see and kiss the fair face he held the white hands in his he could only say over and over again how happy they should be to-morrow his wife to-morrow surely the moon had never shone upon a fairer picture or a lighter heart the ten minutes were soon over good-bye to the moonlight said early to the tired flowers and shining stars and the fair sleeping world he parted with her at the foot of the broad staircase she was going to her room good night said early kissing the red lips good night and sweet dreams but when he had gone about two steps away she called him back again she raised her arms and clasped them around his neck she raised her face that he might kiss it again my darling early my love early my lover my husband she said with a passion of love in her face good night he was half startled he watched her as she went up the broad staircase the white shining silk the gleaming opals the golden hair the fair sweet face watched her until she was out of sight then despite his happiness he turned away with a sigh she will be my own to-morrow and i shall not need to feel anxious over her he said to himself and then he went in to smoke his cigar with the earl doris called in mattie's room and said good night have you any nice book lying about here mattie she asked i know quite well that i shall not sleep i do not feel the least tired she chose one of the volumes mattie brought to her i should like to read that story papa was telling us of she said but it is in the library and he's smoking there with early i would not read it a gloomy melancholic story like that is not fit for your wedding eve doris stood with the wax and taper in her hand even she said if a girl has not been quite good even if she has been what good people call wicked it would be cruel to kill her on her wedding eve would it not what a strange idea doris and how strange you look put that book away and go to sleep so that early may see bright eyes to-morrow they parted and doris passed into her own room according to her usual custom she locked the door and took out the key the first room was her sleeping room she did not wait there it was empty she had told eugene her maid not to wait for her on that evening as she might be late then came the bath and dressing room they also were empty although both were brilliantly lighted she reached the boudoir fitted for her with such taste and luxury the lamps were lighted and there on the chair where mattie and she had so carefully placed it lay the beautiful wedding costume there could be no mistaking it the veil was thrown over the dress and the wreath of orange blossoms lay on the veil she looked at them for some minutes in silence thinking of the miriam who was burned on the night of her wedding day then she opened the book and began to read how useless it was the letters swam before her eyes it was her wedding day to-morrow after to-morrow all her cares and troubles would be over after to-morrow all would be peace she lay down upon the little couch with a long low sigh it was wonderful how tired and weird she felt she had suffered such a fever such a torture of suspense that the reaction of feeling that she was in perfect safety at last was too much for her there came a fever of unrest upon her her heart beat with terrible rapidity her hands were like fire 
her eyes and lips seemed to burn as though they had been touched by flame she had not known until now how much she had suffered then she pictured lord vivianne coming on the twentieth and finding her married married and gone far out of his reach how he would rage it would serve him right he might tell his story then who would believe him they would all think it the bitter exaggeration of a disappointed man then the room seemed to grow warm the perfume of the flowers overpowering i wish she thought that i had not let eugene go i feel nervous and lonely to-night she half debated within herself whether she should go back to mattie or not the sense of being thought cowardly deterred her there lay the moonlight so calm so still so bright streaming through the open window i will go down into the grounds she said to herself a walk there will refresh me and i shall be able to rest she took out her watch and looked at it it was nearly midnight there will be a pale bride to-morrow she said if i am not to sleep all night she unfastened the door that divided the room from the spiral staircase leading to the grounds the staircase itself was almost hidden by dense green foliage and flowers because it was so nearly hidden no one thought it dangerous no stranger would have observed it she went down to the grounds it was so cool so bright still and beautiful the dew was shining on the grass the moon and stars were shining in the sky there was a rich odor of rare flowers the night wind seemed to cool her heated brain her lips grew pale and cool the burning heat left her hands it refreshed her i will walk here for half an hour she said then i shall be sleepy enough it struck her that she would go round to the library window where early was with her father she hoped they would not see her but if they did she should tell them she could not dress then she remembered that the earl had cautioned her never to use the spiral staircase at night lest it should be dangerous she walked around to the side of the house ah there was a light from the library window they were still there then her heart almost stood still she saw the figure of a man advancing across the carriage drive toward the great hall door at midnight who could it be the moon shone full upon him and as he drew nearer she saw the face of her mortal enemy her hated foe lord vivianne end of chapter seventy seven recorded by gabby cowan section seventy eight of a fair mystery this is a librebox recording all librebox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librebox dot org recording by gabby cowan a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter seventy eight why he suspected lord vivianne there was no mistake the moon shone full in his face she knew the impatient walk she knew every line of his figure and for one moment her heart almost stopped beating what in the name of the most high heaven did he want there she saw him going quickly up the broad flight of steps the moon shining on them made them white as snow the light from the library window shone softly on the ground he had stretched out his hand to ring the bell when with a sudden impulse a sudden cry she called out stop another half minute and she had almost flown across the lawn and stood by his side stop she cried again and laying her hand on his arm then she looked at him you she said is it you 
yes lady studleigh there is little cause for wonder it is the man you were about so cleverly to deceive in heaven's name she cried impetuously what has brought you here do not ring the bell what has brought you to my father's house you were not to come until the twenty-eighth in her fear and agitation she lost something of her usual dignity that was nicely managed he replied with a sneer you were to be married on the tenth and i was to come on the twentieth it was dramatically arranged lady studleigh it is very sad it should have failed for one moment her face grew white as with the ghastly pallor of death her eyes grew dim her arms fell nervously by her side so she stood for a few minutes then she said in a low hoarse voice do not ring the bell do not arouse them i will talk to you now come this way side by side they walked down the broad path together in the bewilderment of her thoughts she had but one idea it was to keep him away from the library window now she said breathlessly let us talk here the moon was bright so pitifully bright it traced their shadows along the white stone it seemed to rejoice in the warm night what have you to say he asked curtly i can tell you why i am here i have come for your answer ten days before the time because i have heard that you are going to play me false i am here to tell lord linleigh by what right i claim you as my wife i am here to tell all whom it may concern what you have been to me suddenly she remembered that the room early occupied looked over the terrace what if tempted by the beauty of the night he should come to the window and look out what if the earl should hear voices or see shadows oh what was she to do her alarm heightened by seeing a light at one of the windows opposite whether it was one of the servants or not she could not tell but it alarmed her all at once she remembered that she had free access to the house she had but to go back to her rooms by the spiral staircase again she laid her hand on lord vivian's arm i dare not remain here she said do you see that light we shall be seen what if we are he replied it will not matter if one or two find out to-night what the world must know to-morrow hush she cried in an agony of alarm how cruel how merciless you are great heaven what shall i do you can do nothing now my lady your time is come you should have kept faith with me will you come to my rooms she cried in an agony of terror it seemed to her that his voice sounded so loudly and so clearly in the summer air all the world must hear it to your rooms yes i will go there follow me she said she led the way up the spiral staircase into the boudoir wishing at every step he took he might fall dead she had forgotten the bright eyed veil and the dress lying there the lamps were lighted in the boudoir she carefully closed the door lest any sound should reach their ears then she came back to him he stood on the top of the staircase half uncertain whether to enter or not she went to him by the light of the lamps he saw how marvelously pale she had grown and how terrible was the fear that shone in her eyes he looked carelessly round the room he did not see at first what was the glittering heap of white raiment nor had he noticed the orange wreath but he saw lying on the stand amid the flowers a large sharp knife it had been left there by some careless servant who had been cutting the thick branches that wreathed the windows 
his eyes lingered on it for one half minute if he had known what was to happen he would most surely have flung it far from him she looked up into his face with cold determined eyes now she said do your worst say your worst i defy you women are the greatest simpletons in creation he said they imagine it's so easy to break faith with a man you have to find out how difficult it is she made no reply by right of what has passed between us he continued i claimed you for my wife you told me you would consider the claim and that you would give me your decision on a certain date no answer all the defiance that pride could suggest was in her white face you promised me also that you would not attempt in any way to evade that claim i did and i was quite wrong in making you that promise that is quite beside the mark it has nothing whatever to do with the matter having made the promise you were bound to keep it i relied implicitly on your good faith i left you intending to return and hear your decision what do i find out that you have simply been deceiving me doping me most cleverly as you thought most foolishly as you will see you imagine that on the twentieth i should come to see you and find you married and gone you have doubtless laughed to think how you should befool me i do not deny it she said contemptuously a strange light flashed in his eyes i could have you beware he said i told you long ago that my overweening love for you was driving me mad be careful how you anger me i have the same amount of contempt for your anger as for your love she said take care i have told you before desperate men do desperate deeds take care i have found out your pretty plot and i am here to spoil it what have you discovered she asked for the first thing that while you have been so cleverly deceiving all london you were engaged the whole time to early murray the lover you so kindly left for me after that she asked his face grew dark in its fury as he replied that you love him i do she cried with sudden passion my whole heart loves him my whole soul calls him conqueror he raised his hands menacingly his fury knew no bounds you could strike me she said sneeringly if you kill me i should say the same over and over again i love him and i hate you what else have you discovered that you intend to marry him on the tent that is the extent of my knowledge i know no more but whether you are going to run away with him or whether lord linley intends to countenance a ceremony that will be a lie i cannot tell running away is more in your line certainly could you mind telling me she asked how you know this he laughed i will tell you with pleasure he replied the more so as i think it reflects great credit on my powers of penetration I was in London the day before yesterday, in New Bond Street, and, while walking leisurely along, I met your poet and gentleman, Early Murray. I wish that I could strike you dead for using his name, she said. I am sure you do, and I do not blame you. Under the circumstances, it is the most natural wish in the world. As I was saying, I met your cavalier. He was walking along with a smile on his face, evidently wrapped in most pleasant thoughts. He started when he saw me and looked slightly confused. My poor Early, she murmured. 
my poor early the very fact of his looking confused aroused my suspicion why should he be confused just because he had met me i spoke to him and he seemed disinclined to talk to me another thing struck me he seemed to wish to get rid of me he is very transparent poor fellow i was quite determined that he should not lose me walking on we passed horton and sons the great jewellers and in some vague way lady studley i had a presentiment that i was at one end of a mystery you are a clever fiend she said praise from such lips is praise indeed as we passed the door of horton and sons from the very confused way in which he looked at it i felt sure that he had been inclined to enter in fact that he intended to enter but would not because i was there i instantly resolved that i would baffle him so we walked together up and down the street each time he passed the door i saw him look longingly at it i began to think that i had missed my vocation i ought to have been a detective at last to his utter relief i am sure i said adieu i watched him no sooner had i gone away than he hastened to the shop i said to myself what could he possibly want there what could he want to buy that he would not let me see then i went into the shop after him it is a large place and i stood where i could both hear and see him without being seen or heard innocently enough i laugh when i think of it he asked for a case of wedding rings he wanted the best of solid gold that was to hold you my lady it would require a strong ring to make you all his would it not he asked for the best poor deluded fool her white face and glittering eyes might have warned him but they did not he chose the ring evidently having the size by heart then he asked to see some pearl lockets he selected one and asked for a certain motto to be engraved on it but he asked again when it could be done they told him in two days this did not suit him he must have it in a few hours he was leaving town to-morrow they asked if he would leave it and they would try he replied no that he wanted both ring and locket on the tent and then he left the shop i need not to tell you how that startled me why should he want a wedding ring on the tent then i can hardly tell you how it was a certain suspicion entered my mind that the wedding ring and locket were for you my poor early she said with a long low sigh i secured the services of some one whom i knew to be clever trustworthy and keen we watched your friend and found that he was making preparations for a long absence and that he was going abroad still i must confess i was not prepared to hear that he had started yesterday and had taken a first-class ticket to anderley it did not require a genius you know to pull all these strange coincidences together i guessed in one moment that you were playing me false i should have been here before but that an imperative engagement kept me in town i started at noon to-day and owing to some mistake in the trains i did not reach anderley until too late to take a fly a cab or horse or anything else i was compelled to walk here and that accounts for my delay for my late visit now i am here she looked steadily at him yes she said you are here what do you want end 
of chapter 78 recorded by Gabby Cowan section 79 of a fair mystery this is a librebox recording all librebox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librebox.org recording by Gabby Cowan a fair mystery by Bertha M Clay chapter 79 what happened after midnight my demands are few lady studleigh you are to be married to-morrow to early murray according to your arrangement according to mine nothing of the sort will happen but you will give your poet his dismissal and marry me instead i shall do nothing of the kind my lord she replied yes you will you will find that alternative bad as it is better than the fate that awaits you if you refuse i grant that it is a thousand pities matters have gone so far it is your own fault you will find yourself in a great dilemma you should have been more straightforward to-morrow instead of being married you must tell the earl your father who indulged you so absurdly in everything that you have altered your mind that there will be no wedding after all he cannot possibly be surprised at any caprice of yours it will cause no alteration in any one's plans as no one has been told of the marriage you have planned it all easily she said haughtily yes when one sees such determined opposition to a settled plan it is time to make arrangements i must confess that coming along i planned it all so as to give you the least trouble you are indeed kind she said sarcastically ah my lady i do not mind your sneers not the least in the world you must send for the earl in the morning tell him the wedding must be deferred that you have been thinking matters over and you have come to the conclusion that your happiness is at stake if you do not like to stay here after such a grand expose then ask him to take you abroad or anywhere else i'll join you in a few weeks then my wooing can begin and i will marry you she laughed a mocking bitter satirical laugh that drove him half mad i shall do nothing of the kind she said now for your alternative if you refuse i shall go away now to-morrow i shall return and before the man who is to be your husband before your parents and friends i will tell what you were to me and what my claim on you is very well she replied calmly i accept the alternative tell them i cannot answer for the earl and countess what they will do is of course a mystery to me but early will forgive me i feel quite sure of it he loves me so dearly he will forgive me and make me his wife you will have proved yourself a villain and coward for nothing early will never marry you he said no man in his senses would when he knows what i can tell him i will risk it she replied do you know that it is even a relief to me that the worst is come i do not know what i have dreaded but i am quite sure of one thing you will do your worst and you have told me what it is let the sword fall it has hung over my head long enough early loves me early is just as noble and generous as you are the reverse early is forgiving he will be hurt and angry but when i tell him how vain i was and how you tempted me he will forgive me i do not think so lady studleigh because you don't know him you judge him by yourself even if he refuses to pardon me at first 
if he thinks me beyond forgiveness i will be patient and humble and wait he will love me again in time and my sorrow will purify me from my sin a tender beautiful light came over her white face a sweet smile played round her lips she raised her eyes fearlessly to his you see she said how little you can do after all you might kill me but you could not bend my pride you could not incline my heart to one loving thought of you so i perceive then you positively prefer open shame and disgrace the scorn and mocking of the world yes she said i prefer it you must hate me very much lady studley sudden passion flamed in her eyes i do indeed she replied no woman ever hated man more and yet i love you she turned from him with an air of haughtiest indignation he followed her suddenly his eyes fell upon the white glittering bridal costume what is that he cried and his whole face worked with fury indignation and anger before she could interfere to stop him he had taken the wreath and veil in his hands he laughed as he held them in derision oh fair pure and spotless bride he cried well may they rob your unbridled white hide your face with a bridal veil crown you with orange blossoms they will do well she made a step forward and would have taken the veil from his hands but he would not release it see he cried how i serve your bride i veil i could do the same to your heart and his if i could his face was transformed with rage his eyes flashed fire sudden fury leaped from his heart to his lips sudden murder sprung like a flame of fire that seemed to scorch him he tore the beautiful veil into shreds he trampled it underfoot he stamped on it in the violence of his rage and anger so i would serve you he cried so i would serve him if i could she drew back as his violence increased not frightened she was physically too brave for that but wondering where it could lead him to what he would do or say next you are the falsest woman under heaven he cried you ought not to live you are a mortal enemy of man a weaker or more cowardly woman would have taken alarm and have cried out for help but she did not know fear if she had but given the least alarm there were brave hearts near who would have shed their last drop of blood in her defence who would have died over and over again for her but she stood still with a calm sorrowful smile on her face so much for your veil he cried with a mocking sneer now for the wreath he took the pretty scented flowers from the box where loving hands had so gently laid them and crushed them into a shapeless dead heap that would never lie on your golden hair my lady studley he said she made no effort to save the pretty greed his furious violence dismayed her and made her mute she saw him stamp on the orange blossoms that should on the morrow have crowned her she saw them lie crushed torn destroyed at his feet and she looked on in a kind of trance to her it was like a wild weird dark dream then he took the costly wedding dress with its rich trimmings of white lace and he laughed as he tore it asunder flinging it under his feet then pausing to look on his work of destruction with a smile there will be no wedding to-morrow fair lady he said ah dora why have you driven me mad why have you unmanned me 
why have you made me ashamed of myself there was a strange glitter in her eyes and a strange expression on her face i did not mean to be so violent you have driven me to it not that i regret destroying your wedding dress i would do it over again a hundred times but i am sorry to have frightened you you could not frighten me she replied and if ever calm scorn was expressed by any human voice it was by hers there came a lull in the storm he stood looking partly at the ruin he had caused partly at her she seemed strange to say almost to have forgotten him she stood where the light of the lamp fell on her dishevelled hair and flushed face the fragrant calm of the summer night reigned unbroken outside a calm broken only by the musical rustle of the leaves the moon shone bright as day its beams fell on the sleeping flowers and silvered the waving trees they fell too on the beautiful face with its look of restless scorn during that moment so strangely silent she thought of early early whom she was to marry to-morrow early whom she would marry let the morrow bring what it might no matter if her wedding dress were torn into shreds no matter if lord vivian stood with a drawn sword in his hand to bar her progress to the altar no matter if the whole world cried out with its clanging brazen voice that she was lost she would marry him she turned to her enemy with a flush on her face a scornful light in her eyes you are but a coward after all she said a paltry miserable coward you can do me no real harm and you cannot take me from early you did not always think me a coward my lady dora there was a time when you delighted to sun yourself in my eyes you have not always held aloof from me as you do now i have held you in my arms i have kissed your lips i have won you as no one else will ever win you i like to look at you and remember it i like to dwell on my recollections of those old days ah your face flushes let me kiss you now he hastened toward her trampling in his hot haste on the torn shreds of the wedding dress do not touch me she cried do not come near me i have kissed you before and i will kiss you again he said i will kill you if you dare to touch me she snatched up the first thing that came to her hand it was the long shining sharp knife that had been used to prune the overhanging branches i will kill you she repeated with flaming eyes if you come near me he laughed but the angry blood surged into his brain he went nearer he seized the white hand that held the knife the beautiful face the white bare neck were close to him i hate you she hissed only god who sees all things knows what followed her words may have angered him to murder heat his passion of love and sense of wrong may have maddened him only god knows there was a struggle for one half minute followed by a low gasping cry oh heaven i am not fit to die it may have been that in the struggle the point of the knife was turned accidentally against her but the next moment she fell to the ground with the blade buried deep in her white breast the crimson life-blood flowed it stained his hands still grasping her it stained the torn wedding dress the bridal veil it soon formed a pool on the carpeted floor he stood over her for a minute stunned horrified dora he said in a low hoarse voice oh heaven 
I did not mean to kill her. She opened her eyes, and her white lips framed one word, half sigh, half moan, early, and then the soul of the unhappy girl went out to meet its judge. He made no attempt to raise her. He stood like a man lost. The crimson stain crept onward until it touched his feet. Oh, heaven, he cried again. I did not mean to kill her. Then his whole soul seemed to shrink and wither away with fear. He had killed her. It was the pallor of death blanching the lovely face. And, oh, horror, the crimson stain had reached the golden hair. She was dead. He had slain her in his mad frenzy. He looked at the cruel knife buried in the white flesh. He dared not touch it. He looked at the face so rapidly growing cold in death. He dared not touch it. He would have given his life to have touched those cold, dead lips. But he dared not, because he had murdered her. He clenched his strong hands in an agony that knew no words. Oh, heaven! he cried again i have slain her he gave one hurried glance around on a scene he was never to forget the luxurious boudoir its hangings its lights and flowers the bridal costume all torn into shreds the crimson stain spreading so slowly so horribly the beautiful dead face upraised to the light the white breast with its terrible wound the quiet figure the golden hair and with a moan of unutterable remorse he turned away it just occurred to him that his only safety lay in flight the door was open that led to the spiral staircase the next moment he was creeping along under the shadow of the wall and lady doris studley lay dead and alone end of chapter seventy nine recorded by gabby cowan section eighty of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay Chapter 80 The Silent Bride Good night, Earl, said Lord Linley. Now that is really the last time. You shall not draw me into another discussion. I will not say another word. Remember, you are to be married tomorrow. I am not likely to forget it, said Earl, with a happy laugh. Let us have some rest, said Lord Linley. I am positively afraid to look at my watch. I know it is late. It is not two o'clock, said Earl, but I will be obedient. I will say no more. Yet they talked all the time as they went slowly up the grand staircase. I hope Doris will cure you of liking to sit up late, said the Earl, as he stood for one moment against the door of his room. Hark, said Earl, suddenly bending his head in a listening attitude. Hark. What is it? asked Lord Linley. I fancied I heard a cry, said Earl, and the two listened intently. All was silent. It must have been fancy, said the Earl. It may have been, but it really sounded like a sudden, half-choked cry. Some of the servants are about still. It is nothing. For the last time, good night, Earl. Then they parted, each going to his room. But Earl could not forget that cry. How foolish I am, he thought. But I shall not rest at all unless I know that Doris is all right. He went down the broad corridor that led to her suit of rooms. He saw that the outer door was closed. He listened. All was hushed and silent. There was not a stir, not a movement, not a sound. Good night, my love, said Earl. Fair dreams and sweet sleep. You will be mine tomorrow. It was all right. He laughed at himself for the foolish fear and went back to his own room. He never saw the white, despairing face and creeping figure of the wretched man who had done the atrocious deed. He slept soundly for some few hours. Then the kindly sun woke him. 
shining on his face, a warm, sweet greeting, and he thought heaven was blessing his wedding day. The birds were all singing in the trees, the flowers blooming, and the whole world was fair and smiling. My love will be mine today, he thought. Shine on, blessed sun, there is no day like this. It would have gladdened his mother's heart had she been there to have seen him bend his head so reverently and pray heaven to shower down all blessings on Doris. They had arranged in deference to her wishes that no great difference should be made between this and other mornings. She would not go down to meet them at the early breakfast. She would not see Earl until they reached the church. But Lord Lindley and the Countess Mattie and Earl had agreed to breakfast together. It was about the usual hour when Earl entered the breakfast room. Lady Estelle was there alone. She looked up with a charming smile on her gentle face. Either we are up very early, or the others are very late, she said. She went up to him. I am glad to see you for one moment alone on this happy day, Earl, to thank you for keeping my secret, and pray heaven to bless you and my darling, that you may lead the happiest of all lives together. Then she bent down and kissed him. Her fair hair drooped over him. It seemed to Earl as though a soft, fragrant cloud had suddenly enwrapped him. Then Mattie came in, and a message was brought from Lord Lindley, praying them to wait five minutes for him. It seemed quite natural for Mattie and Earl to pass through the long open glass doors and spend the five minutes among the flowers. You have a glorious day for your wedding, Earl, said Mattie. I think the sun knows all about it. It never shone so brightly before. The best wish that I can offer is that your life may be as bright as the sunshine. And it seemed only natural for him to turn to her and say, Have you seen Doris this morning? No, she replied. She had been to the door of her room, but it was so silent she did not like to arouse her. Then Earl went to a moss-rose tree, and gathered a beautiful bud, all shrouded in its green leaves. Mattie, he said, will you take this to her with my love? What this love is, laughed Mattie, as she went on her errand. While she was gone, the Earl came in, and they sat down to breakfast. It was some little surprise to Earl when Mattie came back with a rose in her hand, Doris is not awake yet, and her maid did not seem willing to call her. She was up late last night, I think. He said nothing, but he thought to himself, it was strange Doris should sleep so soundly on this most eventful morning of her life. They took a hurried breakfast, and then Mattie said, Now it is growing late. Our beautiful bride must be roused. Lady Estelle looked up hurriedly. Is Doris still in her room? she asked. How strange that she sleeps so soundly. In the long corridor, Mattie met the pretty Parisienne, Lady Doris's maid, Eugenia. You must rouse Lady Studley. She'll be quite late if you do not. My lady sleeps well, said the girl with a smile, as she tripped away. It was some short time before she returned. She looked pale and scared, half bewildered. I cannot understand it, Miss Brace, she said. I have been rapping, making a great noise at my lady's door, but she does not hear. She does not answer. Mattie looked perplexed. The maid continued. It is very strange, but it seems to me the lights are all burning. There is a streak of light from under the door. Then Lady Doris must have sat up very late and has forgotten to extinguish them. That is why she is sleeping so soundly this morning. I will go with you, and we will try again. Mattie and the maid went together. Just as Eugenia had said, the door was fastened inside, and underneath it was seen a broad, clear stream of lamplight. Mattie knocked. Doris, she said, you must wake up, dear. Earl is waiting. It'll be time to start for church soon. But the words never reached the dead ears. The cold lips made no answer. Doris, cried the foster sister again, and again that strange silence was the only response. Let me try, Miss Brace, said Eugenia, and she rapped loud enough to have aroused the seven sleepers. Still there came no reply. The two faces looked pale and startled, one at another. I am afraid, Miss Brace, said the maid, that there is something wrong. What can be wrong? Has Lady Studley gone out, do you think, and taken the key of the room with her? If so, why should she leave the lamps burning? Oh, my lady, Lady Studley, do you not hear us? Then Mattie began to fear. What had happened? She waited some time longer, but the same dead silence reigned. What shall we do, Miss Brace? said Eugenia. Her face grew very pale as she spoke. 
I am quite sure there is really something the matter. Lady Studley must be ill. Shall I fetch the Countess? A vision of the fair, gentle face of Lady Estelle, with its sweet lips and tender eyes, seemed to rise before her. No, she replied. If you really think there is anything wrong, you had better find the Earl. But what can it be? Doris, my darling sister, do you not hear? Will you not unfasten the door? I will go at once, said Eugenia. Mattie begged that she would say nothing to the Countess. The maid hastened away, and Mattie kept her lonely watch by the room door. She listened intently, but there was no sound, no faint rustle of a dress, no murmur of a voice, nothing but the glare of lamplight came from underneath. In spite of herself, the dead silence frightened her. What could have happened? Even if Doris were ill, she could have rung her bell and opened the door. There was little likelihood of her being ill. It was not many hours since they had parted, and then she was in the best of health and spirits. The Earl came quickly down the corridor. "'What's the matter, Mattie?' he asked in a loud, cheery voice. "'Eugenia is telling me some wonderful story about not being able to wake my daughter. What does it mean? Doris ought to be dressed and ready.' He started when his eyes fell on Mattie's bewildered face. "'You do not mean to say there is anything wrong?' he cried. "'I hope not. Lord Linley, but we've been here nearly half an hour, doing all that is possible to wake Doris, and we cannot even make her hear. He looked wonderfully relieved. Is that all? I will soon wake her. He applied himself vigorously to the task, with so much zeal that Mattie was half deafened. That will do, he said laughingly. Doris, you heard that, I am sure. There was no reply. Mattie laid her hand on his arm. Lord Linley, she asked. Do you see the gleam of the lamplight under the door? The night lights are still burning. Then he looked a little startled. Matty, he said hurriedly, young ladies live so fast nowadays. Do you think Doris takes opiates of any kind? Anything to make her sleep? I do not think so, she replied. Then again, with all his force, the Earl called to her, and again there was no response. This is horrible, he said, beating with his hands on the door. Why, Matty! Mattie, it's like the silence of death. Shall you break the door open? she asked. No, my dear Mattie, he said aghast. Is there any need? There cannot be anything really serious the matter. To break open the door would be uh, to presuppose something terrible. How foolish I am. There is the staircase. I had forgotten that. He stopped abruptly and turned very pale. Surely to heaven, he cried, nothing has happened through that staircase door being left open. I have always felt nervous over it. Stay here, Mattie. Say nothing. I will run round. As he passed hurriedly along, he saw Earl, who, looking at his face, cried, What is the matter, Lord Linley? Nothing, was the hurried reply, and the Earl hastened on. He passed through the hall, through the broad terrace to the staircase leading to his daughter's suit of rooms. The door was open. He saw that at one glance. Open, so that in all probability she had risen and gone out in the grounds. His heart gave a great bound of relief. She was out of doors. There could be no doubt of it. Gone, probably, to enjoy one last glimpse of her home. There was a strange feeling of oppression, a strange heaviness at his heart. He raised his hand to his brow and wondered to feel the great drops there. I will go to her room, he said to himself. She'll be there soon. She's dreaming her time away, I suppose. Yet he went very slowly. Ah, dear heaven, what is that? A thin crimson stain stealing gently along the floor. A horrible crimson stain. Great heaven, what did it mean? The next moment he is standing with a white, terrible face, looking at the ghastly sight that he is never to forget again, let him live long as he may. The lurid light of the lamp contrasts with the sweet light of day. There on the floor lies the wedding dress, the veil and wreath, torn, destroyed, out of all shape, stained with that fearful crimson, and lying on them, her golden hair all wet and stained, her white neck bare, her dead face calm and still, was Doris, his beautiful beloved daughter. He uttered no cry. He fell on his knees by the fair dead girl and looked at her, murdered, dead, lying there with her heart's blood flowing round her, dead murdered while he had slept all the sudden shock and terror of his bereavement came over him in a sudden passion of despair 
and he uttered one long low cry and fled from the room. End of section 80section 81 of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter 81 how the news was told lord linley rushed from the room like one mad he was utterly lost that his beautiful daughter who was to have been married that day lay there murdered and dead was an idea too terrible to contemplate he fled from the place but he could not fly from reality how in heaven's name was he to confront the mother of this unhappy girl how was he to tell her lover what was he to do for once the courage of the studleys oh fatal boast failed him he sank down on the last step of that fatal staircase white sick trembling and unmanned What shall I do he moaned to himself? Oh heaven? What shall I do? It must be told there was no time to lose even now He could hear a hurried murmur as of expectation and fear When he rose to return his limbs trembled like those of a little child He was compelled to clutch the iron rail and the boughs of the trees for support it was not sorrow he had not realized yet that it was his daughter his only child who lay dead he was simply stunned with horror the dead face the crimson stained hair the bare white breast with its terrible wound the sun shining over the ghastly scene the hall door was open as he had left it and he saw the servants hurrying on their different affairs no murmur of dread had reached them there was to be a wedding and on the strength of it they had each of them received a handsome present their faces were all smiles but one or two passing along looked aghast at the master of that superb mansion with his white face and horror-stricken eyes came in the library was the nearest room at hand he went in tell miss brace i want to see her directly he said and in a few minutes mattie stood trembling before him there is something the matter she said in a low voice and lord linley you are afraid to tell me what it is he could only hold out his hands toward her with a trembling cry oh great heaven how shall i tell her she knelt down by his side and held both his hands in hers she felt that he was trembling the strong figure was almost falling tell me she cried calmly i am strong you can trust me i will help you all i can the good kindly face grew almost beautiful in its look of high patient resolve he raised his haggard eyes to her face mattie he said in a low hoarse voice doris is dead she grew very pale but no word passed her lips she saw that so much would depend on her she must not lose her self-control for one minute doris is dead he repeated and that is not all she has been foully terribly murdered and she was to have been married today she was quite silent for some minutes trying to realize the meaning of his words and then her old prayer stole to her lips we must try to spare earl she said heaven save earl lord linley caught hold of her mattie he said in a low gasping voice quite unlike his own i have not realized yet that it is my child doris I can only understand a murder has been done have I lost my reason no you must be brave she said think of Lady Linley such a blow is enough to kill her his head fell on his hands with a low moan you do not know you do not know all he said just at that moment they heard the voice of Lady Estelle in the hall he started up everything forgotten except the wife he loved so dearly the mother whose child lay dead do one thing for me mattie he gasped go to her on some pretext or other take her to her own room she must not see she must not know keep her there i must tell earl mattie hastened to obey him lady estelle was speaking to one of the servants in the hall mattie she said i do not understand this delay if someone does not hurry matters a little we shall have no wedding today then the girl's anxious face and pale lips struck her 
Surely, she said, there is nothing wrong. Has Doris changed her mind? No, dear Lady Linley, she's not quite well, and probably there will be no wedding today. I want you to come with me to your own room. I want to talk to you. I shall go to Doris, said the Countess. If she is not well, my place is with her. But Maddie caught her hands, and the Countess, always yielding, went with her. Is she really ill, Maddie? Is it some terrible fever, some terrible plague? Never mind. I will go and kiss it from her lips. I must be with her. The poor lady wrung her hands in a paroxysm of despair. Her face quivered with grief. Maddie tried all that was possible to console her. What could she do? It was the heartbroken cry of a mother for a child. But she could not tell. We must be patient, dear lady, she said, and wait until Lord Lindley sends or comes. She persuaded the countess to lie on the couch. She complied, trembling and weeping. You must be hiding something from me, she said. She was to have been married this morning. Oh, Maddie, tell me what it is. Maddie Brace passed through many hours of sorrow and sadness, but none so dark as that which she spent shut up with Lady Lindley. She could hear the sound of hurried footsteps. Once or twice she heard a cry of fear or dismay. She heard the rapid galloping of horses, and she knew that they were in search of the doer of the deed. And yet all that time she had to sit with assumed calm by the side of Lady Estelle. No one came near them. The silence of death seemed to reign over that part of the house, while from Maddie's heart, if not from her lips, went every minute the prayer, Heaven save Earl. What had passed was like a terrible dream to all those who shared in it. Lord Linley had gone in search of Earl. He found him busied in his preparations, happy and light of heart, as he was never to be again. He turned with a musical laugh to the Earl. We have just ten minutes, he said. I hope Doris is ready. Then the smile died on his lips, for he caught one glimpse of the white face and terrified eyes. With one bound he had cleared the distance between them, and stood impatiently clutching Lord Linley's arm. What is that in your face? he cried. What is it? What is the matter? Heaven help you, my poor boy, said the Earl in a broken voice. It would seem better to take away your life at once, than to tell you what I have to tell. Doris is ill? She, no, she cannot have changed her mind again. She cannot have gone away. You will not be married today, said the Earl sadly, my poor Earl. I cannot believe it, he cried. Is heaven so cruel? Would God let that sun shine, those birds sing, those sweet flowers bloom? Yes, kill me, slay me, take my love away. I will not believe it. Hush, said the Earl, laying his hand on the quivering lips. Hush, my poor Earl, whatever happens, we must not rail against heaven. It's not heaven, he cried, I tell you. God would not do it. He would not take my darling from me. You're afraid to say what has happened. I know she's gone away and left me as she did before. Oh, my love, my love, you shall not cheat me. I'll follow you over the wide world. I'll find you and love you and make you my own. Oh, speak to me for mercy's sake. Speak, has she gone? My dear Earl, I do not know how to tell you. Words seem to fail me. Try to bear it like a man, though it's hard to bear. Doris is dead. He saw the young lover's face grow gray, as with the pallor of death. Dead? he repeated slowly. Dead? Yes, but that is not all. She has been, you must bear it bravely, Earl, she has been cruelly murdered. He repeated the word with the air of one who did not thoroughly understand. Murdered? Doris? You cannot be speaking earnestly. Who could? Who would murder her? Lord Linley saw that he must give him time to realize, to understand, and they both sat in silence for some minutes, that ghastly gray pallor deepening on the young lover's face. Suddenly the true meaning of the words occurred to him, and he buried his face in his hands with a cry that Lord Linley never forgot. And so they remained for some time, and then Lord Linley touched him gently. Earl he said, you have all your life to grieve in. We have two things to do now. The white lips did not move, but the haggard eyes seemed to ask, what? We have to bury her and avenge her. We have to find out who murdered her while we slept so near. The word murder seemed to come home to him then in its full significance. 
His face flushed. A flame of fire came into his eyes. He clutched the Earl's hand as with an iron grasp. I was bewildered, he said. I did not really understand. Do you mean that someone has killed Doris? Yes. She lies in her own room there with a knife in her white breast. Listen, Earl, I have my own theory, my own idea. I was always most uncomfortable about that staircase. The door opens right into her room. I have so often begged of her to be sure and keep it locked. I fancy that by some oversight the door was left open, and someone, intent on stealing her jewelry perhaps, made his way to her room. She was no coward. She would try to save it. She would perhaps defy and exasperate the burglar, and he, in sudden fury, stabbed her, and then, frightened at his own deed, he hastened away. There are signs of a struggle in the room, but I cannot say if there is anything missing. I must go to her, said Earl. Nay, replied Lord Linley gently, the sight will kill you. Then let me die. I have nothing to live for now. Oh, my darling, my dear lost love. He knelt down on the ground, sobbing like a child. Lord Linley stole away gently, leaving him there. In another five minutes the whole household was aroused, and the dismay, the fear, the consternation could never be told in words. The servants at first seemed inclined to lose themselves, to wander backwards and forwards without aim, weeping, wringing their hands, crying out to each other that their lady had been murdered while they slept. But Lord Linley pointed out forcibly that someone must have done the deed, and it behooved them to search before the murderer could make good his escape. No one was to enter the room until the detectives had arrived, and men were to mount the fleetest horses to gallop over to Anderley and bring the police officers back with them. Then, when all directions were given, he went back to Earl. He was no coward, but he could not yet face the wife, whose only child lay dead. Earl was waiting for him. Terrible as the moment was, he could not help noticing the awful change that had come over that young face. The youth and the brightness had all died from it. It was haggard and restless, and he looked up as the Earl entered the room. Lord Linley, he said, and every trace of music had died from his voice. It was no fancy of mine last night. That sound I heard last night was from Doris. It was her smothered cry for help, perhaps her last sound. Oh, heaven, if I had but flown when I heard it, flown to her aid, yet I did not go. I went to the very door of her room, and all was perfect silence. Let me go to her. Do not be hard upon me. I must look upon the face of my love again. So you shall, but not yet. Lord Linley shuddered. I would to heaven that I had never seen the terrible sight, he said. But you, Earl, believe me, you could not see it and live. End of section 81《Section 82 of A Fair Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay. Chapter 82 The Captain Asks Strange Questions. Two hours had passed. It was the full glowing noon now of the summer day. The sun shone so brightly and warmly it was difficult to bear its rays. The air was faint with the rich odor of countless flowers. It was musical with the song of a thousand birds, and the bright-winged butterfly hovered round the roses. Then the sweet summer silence was broken by the gallop of horses and the tramp of men. Captain Ireley had arrived with two clever officers. The whole town of Anderley was astir in the silence of the soft summer night. Red-handed murder had been among them, and robbed them of the fairest girl the sun had ever shone on. Foul, sneaking, red-handed murder. The whole town was roused. Some went to the church where the rector awaited the bride, and told him the beautiful girl who was to have been married that day had been found dead with a knife in her heart. Up the broad staircase leading to the grand corridor they went slowly. That little procession of strong men, 
Captain Ireley would not use the spiral staircase. He wished to see the place just as it was. If the outer door is locked, he said, we will soon force it. The next sound heard in that lordly mansion was the violent breaking open of a door. Then, the Earl being with them, they entered, accompanied by the doctor. He could do nothing but declare how many hours she had been dead. Since two in the morning, he believed, and the Earl shivered as he listened. That was the time when Earl had heard the stifled cry. Captain Ireley was shrewd and keen, a man of great penetration. Nothing ever escaped him. He asked each person to stand quite still while he looked round the room. There has been no violent entrance, he said. The murderer must have come up the spiral staircase gently enough. There is not a leaf of the foliage destroyed. He evidently entered no other room but this. Strange. If he came for the purpose of robbery, for there, in the sleeping chamber, I see costly jewels that would have repaid any mere burglar. He looked round again. There are no less than three bells, he said. Where do they sound? One went to the maid's room, another to the servant's hall, and the third to the housekeeper's room. It was a strange thing, said Captain Ireley, that the young lady, having these bells at hand, did not sound an alarm. She had plenty of time. How do you know, asked the Earl, that she had plenty of time? The officer pointed to the bridal costume, all lying in shreds upon the floor. It must have taken some time to destroy those, he said. They could not have been so completely destroyed in one single instant. Look again. You'll find that they have been done with clean hands. There is not a mark upon them. That was done before the murder. The proof is that the lady has fallen, as you perceive, on the debris. You're right, said Lord Lindley. Then, with the same skill and care, he examined every other detail. The Earl told him about the knife. It is, you perceive, he said, a pruning knife. It was fetched from one of the hothouses yesterday to cut some branches Lady Studley said darkened her room. I saw it yesterday afternoon lying on that table when I had come to speak to my daughter. Would to heaven that I had taken it away with me. Captain Ireley looked very thoughtful. If that be the case, then it is quite evident that person did not come prepared to do murder. It must have been an afterthought. Perhaps my daughter made some resistance, tried to call for help, or something of that kind, said the Earl. Still the captain looked puzzled. Why not have called for help while these things were being destroyed, he said. I'm sure there's a mystery in it, something that does not quite meet the eye at the first glance. Will you call Lady Studley's maid? Throw, throw a sheet over there first. That is not a fitting sight for any woman's eye. Then came Eugenia, with many tears and wailing cries. She had nothing to tell, except that last evening her lady had for the first time spoken to her of her marriage, and had shown her the wedding costume. I took up the dress and looked at it, she said. Then I laid it over that chair. My lady wanted to see how large the veil was. I opened it, and we placed it on this chair. The wreath lay in a small scented box on the table. I remember seeing the knife there. It was left yesterday, after the branches were cut. My lady told me to take it back, but I forgot it. She knew no more, only that she had tried her hardest to open the door that morning, and had not succeeded. She was evidently ignorant and unconscious enough. Had your lady any enemy? asked the earl. No, replied the maid. I believe every one who saw her worshipped her. Was there any tramp or poacher to whom she had refused arms or anything of that kind? asked the captain. I should say not. My lady always had an open hand. She expressed no fear last evening, but seemed just as usual, asked the earl. She was happier than usual, if anything, my lord, was the reply. Then the medical details were taken down, and the body of the dead girl was raised from the ground. The doctor and the maid washed the stains from the golden hair. The housekeeper was summoned, and the two women with bitter tears laid the fair limbs to rest. She was so lovely even in death. The cruel wound could not be seen. They would have arrayed her in her wedding dress had it not been destroyed. They found a robe of plain white muslin and put it on her. They brushed out the shining ripples of golden hair and let it lie like a long veil around her. 
They crossed the perfect arms and laid them over the quiet breast. Though she had died so terrible a death, there was no trace of pain on that beautiful face. It was calm and smiling, as though the last whisper from her lips had been anything than the terrible words, Oh God, I am not fit to die. Anything rather than that. Eugenia went down into the garden and gathered fair white roses. She crowned the golden head with them. She laid them on the white breast and over the silent figure, perfect in its pale loveliness as sculptured marble. So beautiful, so calm. Oh, cruel death to have claimed her. Then the maid wept bitter tears over her. She could not tear herself from the room where the beautiful figure lay. Silently the earl entered and bowed his head over the cold face. Hot tears fell from his eyes upon it. I will avenge you, my darling, he said. I will hunt your murderer down. He went back to the room where Captain Ireley awaited him with a strange expression on his face. I do not like to own myself defeated, Lord Linley, he said, but I must own I am baffled here. I can see no motive for this most cruel murder. Robbery, said the Earl shortly. No, I cannot think so. The maid, who evidently understands her business, tells me there is not so much as a ring or an inch of lace missing. Whatever the motive may have been, it was certainly not robbery. If so, when the victim lay helpless and dead, why not have carried off the plunder? There is jewelry enough here to have made a man's fortune. If any one risked murder for it, why not have taken it away? Perhaps there was some noise, some interruption. The man grew frightened and ran away. I see no sign of it. There is nothing disturbed. Besides, my lord, there is another thing that puzzles me more than all. Why should a man, whose object was simply plunder, employ himself in tearing a wedding dress and bridal veil to pieces? Why should he have delayed in order to crush her wedding wreath in his hand and trample it underneath his feet? Especially when, as circumstantial evidence goes to prove, his victim must have been in his presence. Must! If she had any fear, have had plenty of time to have rung for help. I do not understand it. It certainly seems very mysterious, said Lord Linley. I do not at all understand the destruction of the wedding costume. Do not think me impertinent, my lord, if I ask whether there was any rival in the case. This is not a common murder. I would stake the whole of my professional skill on it. It is far more like a crime committed under the maddening influence of jealousy than anything else. I do not see that it is possible. My daughter, as was only natural for a beautiful girl in her position, had many admirers, but there was no one who would be likely to be jealous. Another thing is, by her own especial wish and desire, the fact of her marriage was to be kept a profound secret. No one knew one single word about it except ourselves. And that was by her own especial desire, said Captain Ireley. Yes, it was her whim, her caprice. She may have had a reason for it, said the captain gravely. I should imagine she had. And what would you imagine that reason to be, asked the earl? I should say that for some reason or other. She was afraid of its being known. There are many things hidden in lives that seem calm and tranquil. It seems to me that the unfortunate young lady was afraid of someone, and perhaps had reason for it. The earl sat in silence for some minutes, trying to think over all this daughter's past life. He could not remember anything that seemed to give the least color to the officer's suspicions. He raised his eyes gravely to the shrewd, keen face. You may be right, Captain Arley, he said. It is within the bounds of possibility, but frankly, on the honor of a gentleman, I know of nothing in my daughter's life that bears out your suspicions. Therefore, I should wish you not to mention them to anyone else. They can only give pain. For my part, not understanding the destruction of the wedding dress, I firmly believe that it is a case of intended burglary, and that either, while trying to defend herself or to give the alarm, she was cruelly murdered. I believe that and nothing more. At the same time, if you like to follow out any clue, I will do all in my power to help you. For the present we will not add to horror and grief by assuming that such a crime can be the result of jealous or misspent love. Try by all means to catch the murderer, never mind who or what he is. Captain Ireley promised to obey, yet though they searched and searched well, there was not the least trace, no mark of footsteps, 
no broken boughs, no stains of red finger marks, nor could they find any trace in the neighborhood of tramps, vagrants, or burglars. It seemed to Captain Ireley that the Lindley Court murder would be handed down as a mystery to all time. Lord Lindley did not enter the room where lay the beautiful, silent dead with Earl. He dreaded the sight of his grief. He could not bear the thought of his sorrow. Earl went in alone, closing the door behind him, that none might hear or see when he bade his love farewell. Those who watched in the outer room heard a sound of weeping and wild words. They heard sobs so deep and bitter that it was heart-rending to remember it was a strong man weeping there in his agony. They did not disturb him. Perhaps heaven in its mercy sent him some comfort. None came from earth. Nothing came to soften the madness of anguish when he remembered this was to have been his wedding day. And now his beautiful golden-haired darling lay dead, cold, silent, smiling, dead. What could lessen such anguish as his? End of section 82section eighty three of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter eighty three a mother's anguish they wondered why Lord Linley allowed no one to take the fatal news to his wife but himself. The secret of her early, ill-starred love and marriage had been so well kept all those years, it was useless to betray it now. He knew well what her anguish would be. He dreaded all scenes of sorrow, but he loved his wife, and no one must be with her in the first hour of her supreme trouble and bereavement. He went to her room when the detectives left, and found Mattie still keeping watch over her. Before speaking one word to his wife, he turned to Mattie. "'Thank you, my dear,' he said gently. "'You have carried out my wishes most faithfully. Will you go to Earl? Eugenia will take you where he is.' Then when she had quitted the room, Lady Estelle flung herself into his arms. "'Ulrich,' she cried, "'tell me, what is the matter?' I know that something terrible has happened to Doris. What is it? My darling wife, he said, try to bear it. I have sad news for you, the saddest that I could bring you. Doris is dead. But even he, knowing how dearly the mother loved her child, was hardly prepared for the storm of anguish that broke over her. Dead, she cried, and never knew me as her mother. Dead, and never clasped her sweet arms round my neck dead without one word i cannot believe it ulrich how did it happen oh my darling my golden-haired child come back to me only just to call me mother how did it happen ulrich oh i cannot believe it he was obliged to tell her the pitiful story not one word did he say of the wedding costume destroyed or the captain's suspicion not one syllable yet strange to say the same idea occurred to her his wife had lain her head on his breast. She was weeping bitterly, and he clasped his arms around her. He said in a grave voice quite unlike his own, It must have been some beggar or tramp who knew the secret of that spiral staircase, and had resolved upon breaking into the house by that means. Someone who had learned in all probability that our daughter's jewels were kept in her chamber. Perhaps she carelessly left the outer door unlocked and while she was sitting dreaming, the burglar entered noiselessly, and then when she rose in her fright to give the alarm, he stabbed her. She did not think just then of asking if the jewels were stolen or not, but strange to say, she started up with a sudden cry. Oh, Ulrich, Ulrich, was it all right with her, do you think? I have always been afraid, just a little afraid, since I heard how she begged for secrecy over her wedding. Do you think she was frightened at any one? Perhaps someone else loved her, and was madly jealous of her. He did not let her see how her words startled him, so like those used by Captain Ireley. He tried to quiet her. No, my darling Estelle, Doris had many lovers, we knew them, men of high repute and fair renown, 
but there was not one among them who would have slain her because she loved Earl. Remember yet one thing more. No one knew she was going to marry Earl. It had not even been whispered outside of our own house. It was a robbery and nothing else, carefully planned by someone who knew the only weak spot in the house. I have no doubt of it. Then she broke down again and cried out with wild words and burning tears for her child, her only child, who had never known her as her mother. They wondered again why the Earl, with his own hand, led Lady Lindley to the silent death chamber. He did not wish anyone to be near to see or to hear her. He lived long after, but he never forgot that terrible scene. He never forgot how the mother flung herself by the side of that silent figure, how caressingly her hands lingered on the golden hair, on the sweet dead face. He never forgot the passionate torrent of words, words that would have betrayed her secret over and over again a thousand times had anyone been present to hear them. She laid her face on the pale lips. My darling, she cried, come back to me, only for one hour. Come back while I tell you that I was your mother, darling, your own mother. My arms cradled you, my lips kissed you, my heart yearned over you. I am your own mother, darling. Come back and speak one word to me, only one word. Oh, Ulrich, is it death? See how beautiful she is. Her hair is like shining gold, and she is smiling. Oh, heaven, she is smiling. She is not dead. But he drew her back, telling her it was only a sunbeam shining on the dead face, that she was dead and would never smile again. Only touch one hand, he said. There is nothing so cold as death. She could only cry out, her darling, her darling. Oh, for the days that were gone spent without her. How dearly she would love her if she would but come back again. Lord Linley was always thankful that he had brought her there alone, and though he knew such indulgence in violent sorrow to be bad for her, he would not ask her to go away until it was almost exhausted, and then he knelt down by her side. Estelle, he said, you remember that it was for your father's sake we resolved to keep this secret. Nay, we promised to do so. You must not break this promise now. You kept it while our darling lived. Keep it still. Control your sorrow for your father's sake. Kiss the quiet lips, love, and tell our darling that you will keep our secret for all time. She had exhausted herself by passionate weeping and passionate cries. She obeyed him humbly and simply, as though she had been a child. She laid her quivering lips on the cold white ones and said, I shall keep our secret, Doris. And then he led her away. That same day Lord Linley sent telegrams to the Duke and Duchess of Downsbury and to Brackenside, and before the noon of the next day the Duke and Duchess had reached Linley Court. The Duke took an active part in all the preparations for the ceremony of internment. The Duchess shut herself up in her daughter's room and would not leave her. Later on in the day Mark and Mrs. Brace came. Their grief was intense. Lord Lindley little knew how near he was then to the solving of the mystery, but the same carefully prepared story was told to them as was told to everyone else. A burglar had broken into her room, and in the effort to give an alarm, Lady Doris Studley had been cruelly murdered. Nothing was said of the crushed bridal wreath or the torn wedding dress. Honest Mark never heard that there was any other mystery connected with the murder than the wonder of who had done it. Perhaps had he told the story of Lord Vivian's visit to Brackenside, it would have furnished some clue. But the Earl was deeply engrossed and troubled. Mark never even remembered the incident. Had he heard anything of the captain's suspicions, he might have done so. It did not seem to him improbable that the young girl had been slain in the effort to save her jewelry, and jewel robberies, he read, were common enough. Though the summer sun shone and the flowers bloomed, the darkest gloom hung over Lindley Court. Who could have believed that so lately it had been gay with preparations for a wedding? Lady Doris lay white, still, and beautiful in her silent room. Earl had shut himself up in the solitude of his chamber, and refused to come out into the light of day. 
Lady Estelle was really ill, and the Duchess never left her. The one source of all help and comfort, the universal consoler, was Mattie. In after times they wondered what they should have done without her. The Duke and Lord Lindley were incessantly engaged. For many long years nothing had made so great a sensation as this murder. All England rang with it, so young, so beautiful, so highly accomplished, heiress to great wealth, and on the point of marriage with the man she loved best in all the world. It was surely the most sad and pathetic affair within the memory of man. There was a suspicion of romance in it, too, murdered on the eve of her marriage. Some of the best detective skill in England was employed to trace out the murderer, but it was all in vain. The Duke offered an unprecedented reward, the Earl another, and the government another, but it was all in vain. There did not seem to be the slightest clue, no handkerchief with the murderer's name, no weapon bearing his initials, no trace of any kind could be discovered of one of the most horrible crimes in the whole annals of the country. There had been an inquest. The maid Eugenia, Matty Brace, Earl, and Lord Linley all gave their evidence, but when it was sifted and arranged there was absolutely nothing in it, so that the verdict given was, found murdered by some person or persons unknown. Nothing remained then but to bury her. The brief life was ended. There was no more joy, no more sorrow for her. It was all over. Neither her youth, her beauty, nor her wealth could save her. Her sin had found her out, and the price of her sin was death. There could have been no keener, swifter punishment than hers, and sin always brings it. It seems so easy, the temptation, like that of Doris, is so sudden, so swift, so sweet, the retribution seems so far off. But sure as night follows day, surely as the golden wheat ripens under the summer sun, it comes at last. Until the hour she was taken from the sight of men, she never lost any of her marvelous loveliness. Until the last she looked like a marble sculpture, the highest perfection of beauty. They wondered. Those who loved her best, as they knelt by her side and kissed her for the last time, why such wondrous loveliness had been given to her. It had brought her no good. It had given her swift, terrible death. Rank, wealth, position, all have their perils, but it seemed to those who watched her that surely the greatest peril of all is the peril of beauty. She had been so vain of her fair face. It seemed to her that fair, fragile beauty was the chief thing in life. It had led her to vanity, and from vanity to sin of the deepest, deadliest dye. She had paid the price now. Her life was the forfeit. The sheen of her golden hair, the light of the proud eyes, the beauty of the radiant face, the grace of the perfect figure were all hidden away. That for which she had sinned and suffered, for which she had neglected her heart, mind, and soul, for which she had neglected heaven, was already a thing of the past. Let poets and artists rave of beauty. Let the dead girl answer, What had beauty done for her? End of section 83section 84 of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter 84 a surprise for lord linley the funeral at linley court is still talked of in the county there had not been for many generations such a scene. The whole countryside were present, the rich and noble to sympathize and assist, the poor to look on in wonder. They stood in groups under the trees, discussing the event. They told each other that she had been beautiful as an angel, with hair that shone like the sun, that when she was younger, and before she had come into possession of her fortune, she had loved someone very much, a handsome young poet, and after she came into her fortune, she had been true to him, and had refused some of the greatest men in England to marry him. 
Tears stood in the eyes of those simple men and women as they told each other the story that the night before her wedding day She had been so cruelly murdered by a burglar who wanted her jewelry Was there ever a story so sad? They stood bareheaded as that mournful procession passed by pointing out to each other the chief mourners There was the young poet they said, but who would have recognized Earl his face was quite changed the youth the beauty had died from it it was white with the pallor of despair the eyes were haggard and wild the lips quivered piteously as the lips of a grieving child it was hard to believe that he had ever been handsome gallant and gay women wept as they looked at him and men stood bareheaded mute silent before a great sorrow that they could so well understand there was the earl he looked very sad grieved and anxious but he was a studly and on that debonair race trouble always sat lightly they had grand capabilities for throwing off sorrow they showed each other the stately duke of downsbury one of the noblest men in england who was not ashamed to take his station by the side of mark brace the honest farmer and then followed a long train of nobles gentlemen and friends the long procession wound its way through the park the leaves fell the flowers stirred idly in the summer wind as though recognizing the fact that a fairer flower had been laid low the birds sang joyously as though death and sorrow were not passing through their midst and the bright sun shone warm and golden as they carried the beautiful lady doris to her last home Oh, sweet summer and fragrant flowers, singing birds and humming bees, no sadder sight than this ever passed through your midst. The same minister who was to have married her read the funeral service over her. She was to be buried in the family vault of the Studleys, but at the last Lady Estelle had clung to her, declaring that she could not endure her darling buried out of her sight that she must sleep in the sunshine and flowers where she could see her grave and the duke begged lord linley to grant her prayer so it was done and in the pretty churchyard so green and silent with its tall trees and flowers she sleeps the long sleep that knows no waking the sparrows build their nests there the great church tower is a home for the rooks the wood pigeons coo in the tall trees the nightingale sings her sweetest songs and the fairest blossoms grow over her grave the white marble cross gleams through the trees and on it one may read the short sad story of lady doris studley that same summer day guests and friends returned home the duke and duchess alone remaining with mattie brace mark and his wife took their leave i shall never forget her said honest mark as he wrung earl's hand she was the most winsome lass i ever saw i shall never look up at the skies without thinking i see her sweet face there some months afterward he did not attend to it just then lord linley settled a handsome annuity on the farmer and his wife they lived honored esteemed and respected to a good old age but they never forgot the child who had come to them in the wind and the rain the beautiful girl whose tragical end cast a shadow over their lives a deep settled gloom fell over linley many thought that earl would never recover the spring of his life seemed broken it would have been hard for him if he had never found her in florence but having so found her having won her love her heart her wild graceful fancy having made so sure that she would one day be his wife it was harder still every resource every energy every hope seemed crushed and dead he remained at linley court through the winter lord linley would say to him at times we must think about your future earl it is time something was done his only answer was that he wanted no future that the only mercy which could be shown to him now was an early death and a speedy one they had great patience with him knowing that youth is impatient with sorrow with despair knowing that time would lessen the terrible grief and give back some of its lost brightness to life at the end of the autumn even his physical strength seemed to fail him and the doctors summoned by lord linley in alarm said he must positively spend the winter 
in some warmer climate. Let me stay and die here, he said to the Earl. But Lord Linley had grown warmly attached to him. He was intent on saving him if possible. The Duchess came to the rescue. She said that after the terrible shock, some change was needful for all. If Lady Estelle did not feel equal to going abroad, let her spend the winter at Downsbury Castle with them, while Lord Linley and Earl went abroad together. Though Lady Estelle demurred at being separated from her husband, she saw that the change of scene and travel would be most beneficial for him, so she consented. She went to Downsbury Castle with the Duchess, and Lord Linley took Earl to Spain. They were absent nearly five months, but time and travel did much for them. Earl recovered his lost strength and much of his lost energy. Once more his genius reasserted itself. Once more grand, beautiful, noble ideas shaped themselves before him. Once more the strong, manly desire to be first and foremost in the battle of life came over him. Together they planned great deeds. Earl was to take his place in Parliament again. He was to be Lord Linley's right hand. You will always be like an elder son to me, said Lord Linley one day. I shall have no one to study but you. Then Earl was doubly fortunate. The Duke had an excellent civil appointment in his power. When it became vacant, he offered it to Earl, who gratefully accepted it. Now, said Lord Linley to him, your position is secure, your fortune is made. And Earl sighed deeply, remembering how happy this might have made him once. They were to return to England in April, and then a grand surprise awaited the Earl. He received a letter to say that Lady Estelle, having grown tired of Downsbury Castle, had gone to a pretty estate of his in Wales, Gimglas, and that on his return he was to join her there. What a strange whim, said Lord Linley to Earl, gone to Gimglass. I have not been in Wales for some time. It'll be quite pleasant, quite a treat to me. When he returned to England, they went at once to Gimglass. They reached the hall one fine day in April, when the world was all fair with the coming spring. Lord Linley thought he had never seen his wife looking so young or so fair. He had left her pale with a quiet, languid sadness that seemed almost like despair. Now her face was flushed with a dainty color. Her eyes were bright. She was animated, joyous, and happy. It was a strange, subtle change that he hardly understood. My darling Estelle, he said, how happy I am to see you looking so bright. Has anything happened while I've been away? Am I looking so well, she asked, in a voice so full of heart's music he hardly recognized it. Do you love me better than ever, Ulrich? Yes, a thousand times, if it be possible, he replied. Come with me, she said. He half hesitated. He was tired, hungry, and longing for rest and refreshment. She laughed in a gay, saucy fashion, quite unlike her own. I know, she said. You think a glass of sherry would be far better than any little sentimental surprise I could give you. Wait and see. Follow me. She looked so charming and irresistible, he forgot all that he wanted and went after her. He expected to see a new conservatory or some pretty improvement in the old hall, but rather to his surprise she led the way upstairs. He had almost forgotten the house. It was so large and old-fashioned. The beautiful countess stood quite still as they reached the large door, and placed her finger mysteriously on her lips. I am quite sure that you will be more pleased than ever you have been in your life before, she said. She opened the door and he followed her into a large, lofty, beautifully furnished room. In the midst of it stood a cosy and costly cradle. His wife took his hand and led him to it. She drew the silken curtain aside, and there lay the loveliest babe the sun ever shone on, a little golden head shining with curls, a face like a rosebud with sweet little lips. One pretty hand lay outside on the silken coverlet, Lord Linley looked on in wonder to grateful words. What is this? he said at last. His wife laughed a sweet, low, happy laugh, such as he had not heard from her lips since the days of her happy girlhood. I will introduce you, she said. Lord Linley, this is your son and heir, Lawrence Lord Studley, called in nursery parlance Laurie the Beautiful. 
the earl looked at his wife in a bewildered manner you do not mean to tell me that this is my our son estelle i do indeed ulric i did not tell you before because i was afraid i thought i should die i never even had the hope of living that made me go home with my mother are you pleased why my darling how can i tell you what am i to say to you pleased is not the word i'm lost in delight so i really have a little son raise him he looks like a beautiful bird in a nest place him in my arms and let me kiss him my own little son talk of a surprise this is one call earl darling let earl see him and when earl came just as though he knew he was to be admired and worshipped the baby opened a pair of beautiful eyes and looked so good and sweet that they were charmed lord lindley could not recover himself to think that he who had no hope of succession should suddenly find this pretty little son to the end of his life he persisted in teasing his wife by always calling his eldest son the surprise so that was indeed a happy homecoming earl went to london and then to begin his life's work the earl and the countess returned to linley where in the smiles of her children lady estelle grew young again fair-faced daughters and sturdy noble boys made the walls of the court ring again the earl was happy beyond measure but neither he nor his wife ever forgot the hapless beautiful girl whom they had lost end of section 84section 85 of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter 85 haunted by a dead face two years after the birth of his son the earl and countess went to london for the season it so happened that the desire for a picture he had seen led him to the studio of gregory leslie the artist was engaged for the moment and asked lord linley to wait while so waiting he occupied himself in looking round at the pictures on the wall he stopped before one as though spellbound if ever he had seen the face of his daughter at all it was shining there on the canvas beautiful as the radiant dawn of the morning with the sunlight on her hair and in her eyes a light that seemed to be from heaven she was standing in the midst of flowers and his own face grew pale as he looked at the radiant loveliness of hers doris he said to himself but how comes she here he saw the white hands that he remembered last as folded in death he saw the white graceful breast that had been disfigured by that terrible wound my darling doris he said how came you here he was standing there with tears in his eyes when mr leslie entered the room i should like to ask a few questions about that picture mr leslie he said courteously is it for sale i can hardly say I have had a very large bid for it it was purchased some time since by one of our merchant princes who has since failed and i bought the picture at his sale since then i've been offered a large sum for it it's my daughter's portrait said the earl calmly i cannot see how it came into your possession i painted it said mr leslie you did where did you see my daughter then the artist told him the whole story of his going to brackenside and the earl told him the story of lady doris studley's childhood i never believed that she was mark brace's daughter said gregory leslie she was so daintily beautiful her grace was so complete so high-bred i could not fancy that she belonged to them was the mystery of her journey to florence ever explained what mystery asked the earl quickly so quickly that mr leslie thought that he had been wrong in naming it at all there was some little confusion he said her face is very beautiful it attracted great attention and one of my fellow artists assured me that he had seen her in florence and that she was married nothing of the kind said the earl then an uncomfortable conviction seized upon him could there be any truth in this 
Could there be any truth in the idea, the suspicion, that his wife entertained that all had not been well with Doris? Could there have been a mystery in that young life, so soon, oh, so soon ended? The Earl sighed deeply. It would be better, perhaps, to let it alone. If there had been anything wrong, it was too late to write it now. Let the dead past bury its dead. She was a studly, and there were many of that race whose lives would not bear looking into. He dismissed the subject from his mind, and said to himself he would think of it no more. Who wants this picture? he asked abruptly. I'm sure that Lady Linley would like it. It's a strange coincidence that you should call this morning, said Mr. Leslie. The gentleman who wishes so strongly for it appointed to meet me at two. It wants but ten minutes of the time. Will you wait and see him? Perhaps under the circumstances he might be willing for you to have the original, which I might copy. Lord Linley was perfectly willing. He was rather surprised, however, when the door opened to see, in the expected visitor, Lord Vivian. Lord Vivian, but so changed, so unlike himself, that it was with difficulty he recognized him. His hair was white as snow, his face furrowed with deep lines, haggard, careworn, and miserable. He looked like a man bowed down with care, wretched beyond words. When he saw Lord Lindley, he grew even more ghastly pale, and all sound died away on his lips. The Earl eagerly extended his hand. Lord Vivian, he cried, what a stranger you are. I am heartily glad to meet you again. He did not understand why that great gasping sigh of relief came from the wretched lips. I have thought of you, continued the Earl. Of course you heard the story of my terrible trouble. More ghastly still grew the white face. Yes, I heard of it. Who did not? Poor child, sighed the Earl. It was a terrible blow to us, the very night before her wedding day, too. Ah, the night before the wedding day. He was not likely to forget that. He saw it all again, the beautiful defiant face, the wedding costume, the long sharp knife, the bare white breast. Ah, merciful God, was he never to forget. He groaned aloud, and then he saw the Earl looking at him in wonder. You did not know, Lord Linley, he said, that I loved your daughter. If I had gone to Linley again in August, it would have been to ask her to be my wife. The Earl held out his hand in silent sympathy. It was a terrible blow, he said. Then he thought to himself that it was because he had loved his daughter that Lord Vivian wished for the picture. I fancied once or twice, he said, that you admired her. I did not know that you loved her. I did. If anyone had told me it was in my power to love any woman or to mourn for any woman as I have done for her, I should have laughed at the notion. My life is blighted. They sat in silence for some time. Then the Earl said, I am glad that I have met you. Lady Lindley and I have often spoken of you. Will you pay us a visit at Lindley Court? No, replied the wretched man with a shudder. You are very kind. I thank you, but my visiting days are over. I am nothing but a curse to myself and to others. You will get better in time, said the Earl. It was a new idea to him to play the part of a comforter to a man of the world, and he did it awkwardly. I grow worse, not better, was the desponding reply. I suppose, Lord Linley, nothing more was heard of that dreadful occurrence? The crime was never traced? No, it was one of those mysteries that baffle solution, he replied. The rewards offered have been enormous, and we have employed the best detectives in England without success. It is very strange, said Lord Vivian musingly. Yes, it is strange. I am quite certain of one thing, said the Earl, with energy. It will come to light. Murder always does. It will come to light. The white face grew even whiter. You believe that, said Lord Vivian in a low, hoarse voice. Yes, said the Earl. Although I am not what the world would call a religious man, I am quite sure that a just God will never allow such a crime to go unpunished. Now about the picture, Lord Vivian, if you love my dear dead daughter, I can well understand that you want this. Then they finally agreed that Lord Lindley should have the original, and Mr. Leslie should paint a copy for Lord Vivian. Lord Lindley at the same time ordered a copy for Earl, and then looking at the picture, he saw the name. He looked at the artist with a smile. 
Innocence, he said. Why did you call that picture Innocence? Because the face was so fair, so fresh, so bright, I could think of no other name. There is in it the very innocence and beauty that angels wear. Look at the clear, sweet eyes, the perfect lips, the ideal brow. Innocence, said Lord Vivian, in a strange voice. It was well named. They both looked at him quickly, but he was on his guard again. He shook hands with the Earl. They never met again. He said adieu to Leslie and begged that the portrait might be sent home as soon as possible. And then he went away. The Earl and the artist looked after him. That is a dying man, said Gregory Leslie slowly. If he dies, said the Earl, it will be love for my daughter that has killed him. The Earl was never any nearer to the solution of the mystery. That Lord Vivian, who spoke so openly of having loved her, had any hand in her death, he never even faintly surmised. He took the picture home, and it hangs now in Lindley Court, where the Earl's children pause sometimes in their play to ask about their elder sister Doris, whose name the picture says was Innocence. It was not long afterward that the fashionable world was startled from its serenity by the sad intelligence of the suicide of Lord Vivian. Then they heard a strange story, although no one could solve it. His servants told how dreadfully he had suffered. Let those who laugh at the retribution that follows sin believe. Slowly and in terrible torture had that wretched life ended. He had rushed from the scene of his crime, mad with baffled love, with fiercest passion, with regret and remorse, mad with the wild fury of his own passions, above all with a terrible knowledge of her death. For many days and nights he neither slept, rested, ate, nor drank. He went away to Paris. It was not exactly that he feared pursuit. He knew that it was not likely that any suspicion should attach itself to him. But wherever he went, he saw that dead face, that golden web with a crimson stain. In Paris he plunged into the wildest dissipation. He tried drink, all possible resources, in vain. Where the sun shone brightest, where the gaslight flared, where painted faces smiled, he saw the same sight, a white face looking up, still and cold, in death. If by chance he were left alone or in the dark, his cries were awful, his servants talked about him, but they never thought crime or remorse was busy with him. They fancied he had drank himself into a fit of delirium. They could have told, and did tell after his death, of awful nights, when he raved like a madman, when he was pursued by a dead woman, always holding a knife in her hand. They told of frantic fits of anguish, when he lay groaning on the floor, biting his lips until they bled, so that one's heart ached to hear him. Let no man say that he can sin with impunity. Let no man say sin remains unpunished. The time came when he said to himself deliberately and with full purpose that he would not live. What was this tortured, blighted life to him less than nothing? Once and once only, he asked himself if it were possible to repent. Repent of his sins, his unbridled passions, his selfish loves. Repent? He laughed aloud in scornful glee. It would indeed be a fine thing, a grand idea for him, a man of the world, he who had been complimented on being the Don Juan of the day. He? To repent? Nonsense. As he had lived, he would die. What mad folly had possessed him! He gnashed his teeth with rage when he thought of what he had done. Then something brought to his mind the remembrance of that picture, and his heart filled with hope. Perhaps, if he could buy it, could have the pictured face in its living, radiant beauty always before him, it might lay the spectre that haunted him. It might turn the current. He had forgotten almost what the lovely living face was like. He only remembered it cold and dead. He purchased the picture, but it only worked him deeper woe, deeper, darker woe. He fancied the eyes followed him and mocked him. He had a terrible dread that some time or other the lips would open and denounce him. Then, when he could bear it no longer, he determined to kill himself. 
he would have no more of it. All London was horrified to hear that Lord Vivian had been found dead. He had shot himself. Even the journals that, as a rule, avoided details, told how he died with his face turned to a picture, the picture of a beautiful girl with a fair face, tender eyes, and sweet, proud lips, a picture called Innocence. If anyone dare to believe that he can sin with impunity, let him stand for one minute while a sin-stained suicide is laid in his lonely grave. End of section 85section 86 of a fair mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a fair mystery by bertha m clay chapter 86 silent love rewarded Five years have passed since the occurrence of the events recorded in the preceding chapter. Lord Vivian's place was filled, his name forgotten. Flowers bloomed fair and fragrant on the grave of Lady Doris. The Earl and Countess had drawn themselves more from public life, and found their happiness in the midst of their children. The Duchess seemed to have renewed her youth in those same children and was never so happy as when she could carry one or two of them off with her to Downsbury Castle. One autumn day, Matty Brace stood at the little gate that led from the garden to the meadow. The sun was shining, and the red-brown leaves were falling from the trees. She was thinking of Earl, how prosperous, how fortunate he had been during these last few years, when he had worked with all his heart to drown his sorrow. How he had worked! and now he reaped the reward of all industry success the critics and the public hailed him as the greatest poet of the day in the house of commons he was considered a brilliant leader a brilliant speaker he had speculated too and all his speculations turned out well he had sent his last poem to matty and told her he should come to hear her opinion from her own lips so it was not a great surprise to her on that bright autumn day to see him crossing the meadows How many years had she waited for them there? She thought him altered They had written to each other constantly, but they had not met since the tragedy He was older his face had more strength and power with less brightness She thought him handsomer though so much of the light of youth had died away from him he held out his hand to her in loving greeting, and then he bent down and kissed her face. Such a kind, sweet face, Matty, he said, and it is sweeter than ever now. He spoke truly. Matty Brace had never been a pretty girl, but she was not far from being a beautiful woman. The rich brown hair was smooth and shining as satin. The kindly face had an expression of noble resolve that made it beautiful. The brown eyes were clear and luminous. The lips were sensitive and sweet. Earl looked at her with critical eyes. You please me very much, Matty, he said. Do you know what I've come all the way from London to ask you? No, she replied in all simplicity. That I do not. I want you to be my wife, dear. I know all that lies between us. If I cannot offer you the enthusiastic worship of a first love, I can and do offer you the truest and deepest affection that a man can give. I always liked you, but of late I've begun to think that you are the only woman in the world to me. Can I make you happy, Earl? she asked gently. Yes, I'm sure of it. But I'm not beautiful, she said sadly. An expression of pain came over his face. Beauty! Oh, Matty, what is it? Besides, you are beautiful in my eyes. Be my wife, Matty. I will make you very happy. It was not likely that she would refuse, seeing that she had loved him for years. They were married, much to the delight of Lord and Lady Linley. Now Earl has a beautiful house of his own. His name is honored in the land. His wife is the sweetest and kindest of women. His children are fair and wise. 
He has one golden-haired girl whom they call Doris, and if Earl loves one of the little band better than another, it is she. He has a spacious and well-adorned room opening on a flowery lawn. It is called a study, and here, sometimes at sunset, his children gather round him, and they stand before a picture, a picture on which the sunbeams fall, shining on a radiant face, with bright, proud eyes and sweet, smiling lips, a picture known to them by the name of Innocence. End of section 86 and the end of A Fair Mystery by Bertha M. Clay.